Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku took on the Chaos King part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Yakasuka Prefecture, 20xx. In the 12 years since one for all fully awakened, a new sense of peace fell upon the earth. Brand new heroes dominated the scene and embracing what all might struggled to teach others. Heroism is more than sound bites and product endorsements. Heroism was and would always be about saving people and bringing joy and hope to those who needed it. While the ever-eternal battle against good and evil continued to rage across the planet, many heroes and aspiring ones at that all remembered the road taken to get to this point. The rebirth of the symbol of peace was not one event easily celebrated, as it has coincided with a dark moment in modern Japanese history. The true fury of evil surged throughout the country before stopping in the heart of Tokyo. When the symbol was reborn, the world started to realize just how broken everything truly was. Today, a new threat had arisen. What was once a small-time organized criminal gang evolved into a multinational criminal empire. Drugs, weapons, people, quirks, everything was on the table for this empire. And while the world waged war against this new evil, the symbol of peace was hard at work. On the banks of Atala Bay in Yakasuka Prefecture, an abandoned seaport was currently used by the criminal empire known as the Discord Association. The group had a simple three-story building surrounded by several warehouses, vehicle depots full of 18-wheelers, and what appeared to be soldiers. The main building had a single flag flying at the top with the Chaos Star depicted. Inside one of the warehouses, a moderate group of armed and powerful gang members stood on guard. The room was basically bare except for a few open boxes and a single chair in the middle. The chair had a single hero strapped down with steel cuffs around the legs and large steel gauntlets held far apart by chains. Two gang members held the chains, wearing matching black suits and ties with the Chaos Star pinned onto their jackets. The hero they had wore a dark green suit with dark silver trimmings running throughout the torso. He wore a simple red utility belt and matching green pants. Instead of wearing a pair of bright red boots and a white cape behind him, he wore no shin armor. He had a metal blindfold over his eyes, and his once unruly green bushel of hair was trimmed down into a bit of a fade. This was the symbol of peace, Deku. He was bulkier than his Yua days though it wasn't like All Might's old body. It was modest, firm and his suit was form-fitting. A door on the far side of the building opened and slammed shut. A large man walked over to the bound hero. He wore a dark steel three-piece suit and towered over Deku. He had a military-issued bus cut and two scars running down his right cheek. His skin was ashen gray, and his eyes were a piercing blue. He wore two golden knuckle dusters on his hands and the Chaos Star pin, although the pin had a crown on top of it. The giant of a man nodded at the two guards holding his arms apart. One of the men grabbed Deku by the hair and yanked his head back. Maybe I should cut it shorter. He mused. Quiet. You speak to the king. One of the guards said. And here I am without a gift, Deku muttered. The giant of a man raised a brow as he looked at the guards. Look, I don't even know why we're doing this. We have this whole routine, and I feel like we threw it away with this. So, how about you let me go? I go outside for a few minutes because I am starving, and we do this whole thing over again. No, the giant man said with a low and thunderous voice. Deku sighed. Would you want me to pick something up for you then? You'll have to pay me back later, he said. No, Deku chuckled. Aw oh, come on Chaos King. I thought you were a man of more than one word, he teased. The Chaos King growled. You'll learn your place, boy. But first, I want answers, he said. Deku shrugged. Ask away. He said nonchalantly. The giant man eyed one of the guards before asking. Why is it that the greatest hero the world has ever seen decided to sneak onto my private property, assault my guards, and nearly break into my home before being subdued? Also, we checked and saw that you didn't have a warrant, he said. He placed a hand on his shoulder. I'd hate to think you've gone rogue. Deku chuckled and shrugged off the giant's hand. Funny, because I seem to recall you illegally crossing national borders, kidnapping people, and stealing quirks all to make a few bucks. Sneaking onto a fortified villain hideout isn't that bad, he said. The Chaos King chuckled. Sneaking, you say. You were caught like the amateur that you are. I commend you on going pro while young, but your naivety is laughable, he said. Deku smiled. Is it? The villain eyed the hero with narrow eyes and a sneer. Speaking of my fortress, how did you find it? It wasn't supposed to be easy to find, he wondered. Deku shrugged. Google, honestly, the fact that the website still works is incredible, he said. The villain growled. Answer the question. I thought I did, Deku said. The Chaos King roared at him and grabbed him by the neck. You have five seconds before I crush your goddamn neck. The pro hero only chuckled. Inside one of the steel gauntlets where his arms were. One of his white gloves had a secret button installed on the side of his index finger. He pressed the button and clenched his fists. 
Why you know, this would scare me if you were serious. He said. The villain growled in his throat. I am serious. I have no problems killing the symbol of peace right here, he threatened. True, but I don't want to die in Ottawa Bay. Honestly, I was hoping to die someplace quiet. Like in a small town somewhere in the country, Deku said. The Chaos King relaxed his grip on his neck. W what? Though, to be fair, the bay is nice. Just, not where I want to die, Deku said. The villain dropped the hero. H how? Because my getting caught by you was planned. Honestly, I snuck onto that mansion of yours about three times on three different nights. And you hadn't noticed that I put up no fight when I got caught yesterday. That didn't strike you as odd. Hi I. Boo what? Here's the thing. Usually, I'm wearing my full shield when we meet. But I wore my Air Force gloves and Gamma Arm braces. Now, why would I change it up? The Chaos King's jaw had dropped. Honestly, your cockiness will bring you down. No matter how tall you get, you're always one mistake away from someone yelling timber, Deku said. As he said that, an explosion rocked the warehouse. The Chaos King scanned the room, though he didn't see where it came from. Let's see. A room this big must mean you have space to spare outside. Thanks to Super Sense, I can smell many of your gang members in here, even when I was being dragged while I was unconscious. Large facility maybe. Judging from the heavy machinery I kept hearing out there. This must be your distribution outpost. Gun, drugs, and stolen quirks all ready to be shipped halfway across the world, Deku stated. Another explosion erupted outside. This one sounded closer by how much clearer it was to everyone in the room. MMM, sounds like a wall came down. I don't need an enhanced hearing power to know your heart rate just jumped. Your Majesty, Deku said. The Chaos King clenched his fists. How? Deku shrugged. It was a team effort, he simply said. At those words, the building's east wall exploded, and an angry die soon followed. Emerging from the black smoke and fire was the blonde demolitions expert known as Dynamite. His hero outfit consisted of the same top he usually wore for winter with upgraded grenade bracers. He had a mini-missile turret on his right shoulder. He wore more fitting pants without the knee bracers while keeping the boots he wore during his time in Yue. He wore no mask nor the orange and black flares. His entrance shocked the villains in the room with many of them sent into the air by the sheer force of his entrance. Deku wore a gentle smile as dynamite landed. Three moves to check, asshole. The Chaos King raised a brow. You play chess too. Dynamite smiled wide. War is chess, in case you haven't figured it out, he said. The Chaos King approached the explosion hero, but his advance stopped as another explosion rocked the room, this time at the western wall. He turned on a heel to see the innovative Creative standing there with a metal bat in her hands. Her initial outfit hadn't changed much since her time in Yue, however, she did wear a sort of helmet with a transparent visor, showing off much of her face. Her hair wasn't as long as before, however, removing much of her signature ponytail. Her piercing glare met the Chaos King's as he growled. The gang members tried swooping in to subdue her, only to be dealt with quickly, creating the same confetti cannons she made during the cultural festival. She blasted the streamers into some gang members' faces, causing a few to fall over. She ducked as a swing of the butt of a rifle came at her from behind. She spun on her heel and slammed the offender in the stomach with her bat. She rose and swung the bat again in an upwards right angle, sending him to the floor. She stepped back as other guards came rushing in. The villain watched the raid take place, and before he thought it was enough, the glass ceiling above him shattered, and two bodies fell from the sky. Two gang members with physical quirks slammed into the ground as Uravity landed with one foot on each of their backs. Her suit stayed somewhat similar from the winter of her first year, though now she had a bow staff on her back and a pair of nunchucks strapped to her waist. She quickly got off the guards and unleashed her fighting style against the advancing guards. As the fighting took place, the Chaos King soon realized that he stopped paying attention to Deku. He turned on his heel and watched as he kicked the restraints off from his ankles. He rose and pulled the two guards right off their feet, sending them flying in opposite directions. He then slammed the metal gauntlets together, freeing his hands. He removed the blindfold and smiled at him. It was a trap. Three days ago. You fucking moron. If he doesn't think it's a trap, he's even stupider than you are. Back you go bellowed. And yet it's better than posing as a delivery girl and picking up the supplies, Yeyarazu remarked. It's doable. Izuku Midoriya, symbol of peace, pinched his nose at the argument before him. He and Yeyarazu devised a little plan to sneak onto the Chaos King's compound to conflict with Bakugo's blast now and ask questions never planned. While the two argued over the plan's basics, he and Yuraka were sitting with Kyoka Jiro and Toru Hagakir. The two were visiting while in town on separate occasions. Midoriya asked Hagakir to come by for some help, and Jiro wanted to catch up with some friends. Of course, most of the time, Hagakir was in her hero uniform, which meant a few awkward collisions from time to time. Geez, he hasn't aged well, Jiro remarked. 
That's what happens when a case this big comes up, Yuraka stated. He hasn't been home in a while, so, understandably, he's a bit cranky. I'll blast you back to the Stone Age, you damn 3D printer. Okay, that's rude. As the argument continued, Hagakure turned to the green hero. How's everything at home? You guys set a date yet? She asked. Midoriya shook his head, still trying to find a catering agency. And as much as I love Sato's cakes, they're too heavy on sugar, he stated. I got a real suit, though. Yuraka nodded. As much as I loved the old brown with red shoes, they had to go. It's a big day, and you need to go beyond there. Hagakure giggled while Gyro continued to watch the argument. What about you, guys? Midoriya asked. Well, we got a few more sessions in the studio to finish before we can drop a new album. But other than that, things are good, Gyro said. And I'm getting a haircut next week. Hagakure noted. Midoriya stopped worrying about Bakugo blowing up their agency for a moment. Well how? X-Ray Vision Barber. I met him while on a job, and... Well, that was awkward. But later, he offered to cut my hair if the need arose and... Well, it's risen, she stated. In a world filled with different quirks, I'm sort of surprised I never encountered an X-Ray anybody. Iraraka shook her head while keeping in her laughter. We were you in your hero uniform. Hagakir was silent for a moment before answering. Uh, yeah. He was very professional about it. And Ajiro was alright about it. Yuraraka asked. Well, this guy isn't exactly playing on the same team as most guys. Basically, it was more shock than embarrassment, she admitted. I gotta say it was pretty funny when she told me about it over the phone. I couldn't stop imagining that encounter all day and nearly ruined an entire recording session, Gyro said. She shook her head and kept from laughing as she thought about it some more. Midoriya smiled before his attention returned to the scene unfolding. Yeirazu had a metal bat in her hands, and Bakugo was about ready to level the building. The inheritor leaped from his seat and grabbed both of them. Knock it off. He boomed. Iraraka shivered at his command. Both of you quit it. We're pros, not second years at UA. Now, Bakugo apologized for calling her a 3D print and overly busted 3D printer. The creation heroine corrected. Bakugo flinched at the words. Midoriya looked at him with a raised brow and a shrug. The hell? The explosive hero shrugged. Guys, seriously. We're a strike team, which usually means we work together to fight big-time villains. Can we at least pretend to get along until we take down the Chaos King? Midoriya asked. This is a stupid plan, and she knows it. There's no way he won't think it's a trap. Bakugo bellowed out. So you're quick to abandon the idea without hearing about any failsafe then? Honestly, how do you have a wife? Momo retorted. It beats being single, Miss Strikeout. Excuse me. Midoriya powered up one for all and stomped the ground, sending a shockwave that disrupted the two bickering heroes. Enough. We need a plan to keep the Chaos King from escaping to America. And blowing up the agency isn't a productive way of doing things. He boomed. Yeirazu smirked before Midoriya turned to her. And provoking him isn't a great way of having fun. I should know. He said. The everything heroine blushed as she looked away. Midoriya sighed as he powered down his quirk. Okay, I think we need a break. I'm going to explain to the officer standing outside that it was me that caused that earthquake. In the meantime, you guys head to the lounge to cool off or go on patrol. You guys need a break from each other, he said. He turned to the staircase on the far wall and ascended to the ground floor. All of the heroes stood around until Hagakir shot straight up. I'm gonna go too. I need to swing by the store to pick up a few things, she said. Jaira waved the invisible hero off as she ascended the stairs. As she left, Yuraka stared daggers at Bakugo and Yeirazu as she stood up. I know it's been a hard three years, but we're close. We have the perfect chance to capture this guy and be done with his Discord army bullshit, she said. One more week, and then we can disband the strike team. The two nodded. I'll go check on Deku before we close up for the night. I'll see you guys tomorrow. And then the gravity heroine ascended the stairs. Today, Deku leaped out of the way as the Chaos King smashed the chair he was sitting in. The Inheritor quickly shifted his momentum to launch himself at the villain with incredible speed. The villain had no time to react as the symbol of peace snapped a roundhouse kick at him, landing in the crook of his neck. The villain staggered backward before launching an uppercut at the hero, barely missing the hero's chin. As he dodged, Midoriya fired a Delaware smash underneath the villain, sending him flying out one of the windows. Now clear of the villain, he punched two criminals as they tried charging at him. 380, go to the transport system. Dynamite cover her. Don't tell me what to do, Deku. Dynamite bellowed as he launched himself into the air in between Kreati and the villains trying to follow her. Kreati ascended the stairs leading into the office and kicked the door down. She swung her bat, dealing with the villains inside. Gravity, secure the building. Once you're done here, take the main office building. Got it. With the mission underway, Deku burst through the broken window he sent the Chaos King through and landed in the courtyard. He dropped in the middle of carnage as the area was littered with unconscious villains with either burn marks or serious bruises on exposed skin. 
He smiled as he rushed toward the villain in charge. The giant had already picked himself up and held a futuristic rifle. It was silver with a large barrel and several electrical conduits protruding from it. As soon as Deku was in sight, he fired what appeared to be an electric charge at the young hero. The hero dropped to the ground and immediately rose to fire a column of air at the king. The rifle flew through the air, forcing the Chaos King to close in for close combat. As the king swung, Deku effortlessly dodged as he backed up. Even as the symbol of peace, you dodge. What does that say about you? Well, to be fair, I was chained up for several hours, so I'm still a little tired, he responded. The Chaos King growled, trying to play smart. Huh, you won't be in a joking mood when I rip your quirk from your body. Deku smiled, feeling better now, and then he swung his fist. Thanks to one for all, the Chaos King didn't register his movement until the point of impact. The punch was a snap from his body and with enough power to send him flying through a pile of crates filled with contraband guns. The symbol of peace grimaced as he chased after his opponent. He leaped over the crates of guns only to be smashed by a larger crate. Deku was sent flying as the Chaos King recovered with another futuristic gun in his hand. The symbol of peace performed a flip in the air and landed on his feet. Smiling at the attack, he charged at the villain. The Chaos King fired the weapon at him. Arcs of electricity were shot through the air and barely missed the hero as he sidestepped the energy. As it passed him, Deku felt the effects of his quirk falter. I hate these things, he muttered. The effect was temporary and wore off when the hero closed into the villain. He punched the gun, smashing it to pieces, and grabbed the villain's tie. Deku landed a solid punch on the villain while not putting his cap into it. The Chaos King faltered, opening him to a front kick to the stomach. Midoriya continued to move forward while throwing punches and kicks at the villain. One punch barely missed the villain, giving him a second to recover. He rose high and slammed both of his fists on the ground between them, sending a wave of energy at the hero and sending him back. The attack loosened some of the ground, giving the Chaos King access to some earthly ammunition. He picked up and threw a boulder at the hero, only to be smashed into pieces by a smash. The Chaos King continued to fire boulders at the hero. As Deku continued to dodge, he began to feel irritated by the growing sneer on his face. Gotta end this. The symbol of peace leaped to the side and out of the villain's line of sight for a minute. He immediately slid his shoes off as well as his gloves, clipped just below his kneecaps and on each wrist were silver bands with a large S on the fronts. One for all. Full shield. The devices all glowed brightly. The bands under his kneecaps created a technological waterfall down his legs while also creating the same effect for his knees. On his arms, the forms of shiny metal gauntlets appeared. His legs turned into the same armor-like metal form as the arms. His boots were replaced with the same material with black soles underneath. The Chaos King looked stunned at the transformation. Deku stood proud with a light breeze carrying the cape on his back. Let's finish this, Chaos King. He boomed. The sound of thunder woke the villain from his trance. A storm was brewing. A perfect background for their final battle had made itself known. The Chaos King adjusted his knuckle dusters and wiped some of the blood that had formed on the corner of his mouth. Yes, let's finish this. They both charged at each other. You a high cafeteria, 2xxx. Izuku Midoriya's stomach growled like a feral beast as he paid his respects before chowing down at his cutlet bowl. His action did cause a gentle chuckle from Achako Yuraka as she watched her boyfriend eat. The duo, along with some of their classmates, were all eating their lunch in earnest. They had just come from their workout with Snipe and Cementos and had earned their delicious reward from lunch rush. Edo was quietly eating his food as he watched his classmates' eager behavior. Midoriya, I know a balanced nutrition and replenishing energy is vital to being a hero, but you're scaring me, he said. The inheritor blushed as he swallowed the rice he still had in his mouth. S sorry, I'm starving. That class took a lot out of me, he admitted. A little further down the table, Yeirazu was listening in. Of course, but that kind of behavior is unsettling. Please restrain yourself, especially since you could choke on your food if you don't take it easy, the former class rep said. Yeirazu looked up from her food. To be fair, I'm usually like that as well with my quirk. And he's not wrong either, Ida, she said. The former class rep shrugged. I didn't see you use much of your quirk, Yeirazu. Is everything okay? She nodded. I've been trying to get another special move besides my lucky back. But I can't seem to get the configuration right, she said. What you have in mind, Yao Momo? Uraraka asked as she ate her chicken meal. Well, the everything hero set her utensils down. I had this dream, and don't laugh at me here. But this dream kinda had me with a, well, a portable cannon, Midoriya, Ida, and Uraraka all turned toward her with surprised expressions. A portable cannon, Ida asked. Well, yes, I mean, the possibilities are endless when I think about it. Some serious stopping power and not having to rely on finding a specific space to set up while on the battlefield. And I imagine that creating it will be easier than making a full cast iron cannon, she argued. That is true, I've seen you make that cannon of yours. Looks exhausting, Ida commented. 
Gayarazu nodded. As they continued eating, Yuraka made a sideways glance at the inheritor next to her. Ever since he fully awakened Float from All Might's old master, all Midoriya had been doing was either eating, sleeping, or just seemingly distracted. She had noticed that he would sometimes stare off into space during their lectures. On one occasion, he hovered just a little bit too, at the ire of Shinzo behind him. His behavior with his lunch was proof of it. Maybe it's a side effect of his quirk. Like Yeirazu's. As they ate, the sound of helicopter blades interrupted the peace. They all looked outside to see a small helicopter flying toward the roof of the building. Huh, I've never seen anything get this close to the school before, Midoriya commented. Probably on its way to an event or something. Ida wondered. Still, it's weird that it's flying pretty low. The two shrugged and continued eating. As they ate, another student came up to their table with an empty tray in her hands. Hi, Midoriya, she called out bashfully. Midoriya waved at her as she walked away. You know her? Yuraka asked. The inheritor shook his head. Gotta say hi back, though, right? It is polite. Gyro commented a few seats over. Ida nodded. They continued eating when the same girl came back around. This time, she flashed a wicked smile at him while waving again. She stopped in place for a quick moment and kept her gaze at him before moving on again. As she disappeared back into the crowd, Midoriya eyed his two friends with a worried look on him. T that was weird. He commented. And kinda creepy, Yuraka said. The inheritor nodded, and right before he could take another bite, a scream erupted. She looks exactly like me. Who are you? The crowds of students suddenly turned to the source of the voice. She's got a knife. What the hell? She's melting. Midoriya dropped his chopsticks as his gaze met Yuraka's. The gravity heroine leaped from her seat as the inheritor powered up full cowling and leaped into the crowd. As he approached, he saw them. Himiko Toga and Spinner, members of the Paranormal Liberation Front, had their weapons drawn against the students. Some of the students stayed back since they weren't authorized to handle the villains without a staff member nearby to aid them. But when Toga looked up to see Midoriya charging at them, she nearly dropped her knife in surprise. I see you, you. The words traveled down his spine like ice-cold water. Only my friends can call me by that. He boomed. The smile didn't fade from Toga's face as she readied a spare knife. Oh, trust me. We'll be good friends one day. And she threw the knife. The inheritor dodged the knife as Spinner screamed out, don't kill him, and grabbed her by the arm before running down the hall. Midoriya landed and gave chase with Yuraka behind him. Come on, those of you with a provisional license follow me. Yuraka called out, earning a small response from some of the onlookers. A student without a license ran to an alarm and activated it. In the future, it was clear that a storm was approaching the area. If the thunder and the wind weren't enough, the remaining conscious criminals ran for safety as the symbol of peace waged war against the Chaos King. Despite being as tall and built as a mountain, the Chaos King moved with the agility of a rabbit against Deku. His punches, coupled with his knuckledusters, tore through the ground where the hero leaped from. He blocked his shoot style at multiple angles while also dealing significant damage to the hero. Thanks to one for all, Deku was also as fast as the giant. He powered through the king's punches by using their power as momentum to counter his own attacks. One punch, in particular, was aimed at his cheek and sent him staggering backward. Using his own momentum, the symbol of peace turned right back around and countered. The Chaos King and Deku leaped away from each other. The symbol of peace was breathing heavily while the villain was simply readjusting his tie. I, I must say, I was sort of expecting more from you this time around, he taunted. The ultimate power lies within you, and you still hold back like a child. Pathetic. The hero said nothing. He clenched his fists and charged back into the battle, meeting the Chaos King's raised guard with extreme resistance. My, if I didn't know any better, I'd say your heart isn't in this tonight, the villain said. Deku's eyes burned as he launched another punch. This time, a rising uppercut caught the villain's jaw as he was launched a few feet into the air before landing back onto the ground. Trust me when I say this, I'd rather be doing a lot of things tonight. My little girl will be graduating from you as soon, and she doesn't have her quirk. The Chaos King laughed as he picked himself up. You know, I hate you for a lot of things, like wrecking my supply depots and terrifying my allies into submission, but I applauded you when I learned it was you that rescued Little Eerie. Deku smiled. I wasn't the only one. The villain returned the smile before they exchanged punches again. I must commend you, though. You took down the Paranormal Liberation Front, unhinged terror groups around the world, and you've managed to force me into a full fight for the first time since Crisis. Trust me, kid, you should quit while you're ahead, the villain said. Deku effortlessly dodged his many strikes. These aren't achievements I'm proud of. The PLF changed Japan indefinitely, giving you the chance to take power. Terror groups being trampled on is good, but only until a new group rises. And you, it's been five years, and I couldn't get close to you like before, he said. He raised a block against a particular strike and swiped at an incoming jab before quickly countering with a snapping cross. The strike forced the villain to stagger backward. 
clutching his nose as he faced his enemy. The Chaos King growled as he lunged forward, you're bold, and you're fun to hit. Funny how we complete each other when we are locked in combat. Deku fired back. The giant cracked a small smile as he fired a single strike at the symbol of peace as he fired his. The power from both of their attacks sent them flying in separate directions. Deku stopped in midair and landed on his feet before blasted off at his enemy. The Chaos King did the same. The two enemies held their fists up high as they charged at each other. When the alarms sounded throughout the school, the pro heroes on site all converged on the lunch hall. When some of Wana told them that Midoriya and Yuraka were chasing the villains, well, they feared exactly what had happened several months prior, an accidental dimensional jump. Passing through the small garden in the middle of the second level, Toga and Spinner shot daggers at some of the students who were on their tails. With Midoriya right behind them, Toga kept missing while being captivated by his presence. Spinner shoved two students to the ground as they both leaped up and latched onto a rope drop from the helicopter hovering above them. Inside, Mr. Compress was waiting with two other grunts from the P. L. F. The magician-like villain was at the controls while one of the grunts was hanging out of the open door with the rope's other end in his hands. Let's get going. Boss wanted us in an hour ago. Toga rolled her eyes as she climbed the rope. Don't even think about sneaking a peek, Spinner. Trust me, you're not my type. Pink, pudgy and annoying isn't my cup of tea, was his response. Midoriya and a few other students arrived at the base of the rope. Let's go. He climbed the rope while another latched onto the wall and climbed much like a spider. The spider student reached the two villains first. A third-year student on the cusp of graduation launched a web from her mouth in an attempt to catch Toga but instead grabbed a knife that Spinner threw to intercept it. The student caught the knife and webbed it onto the window before reaching for the lizard-type villain. The villain responded with a slash at her arm, drawing a significant amount of blood. Her scream was not ignored as Midoriya's focus was focused on his classmate. She tried grabbing the building with her injured arm, but the pain shot through her arm, causing her to lose focus on the task. She slipped down the building before she was knocked back and fell. The inheritor's reaction was instant. He yanked himself up the rope and reached out to catch the student bridal style. Without his grasp on the rope, the two plummeted to the ground, and right before they hit the ground, Midoriya felt a cushion of air from underneath him. He hovered for a moment before settling down. While another student tried to climb the rope, Midoriya carried the spider-like student to an empty bench. The girl was clutching her arm with blood seeping through it. Damn it all. He got me good. She cursed. Are you alright? I mean, it didn't go too deep, did it? Midoriya asked. She shook her head. Just a reactionary slash. Damn bastard. Yeirazu and Snipe both ran into the garden along with recovery girl. Midoriya. The everything hero called out. What happened? She got slashed. Midoriya responded. Can you make some medical supplies? Yeirazu came over and inspected the wound along with recovery girl. Mm, that's a lot of blood. Miss, make some bandages and alcohol if you can. The knife could be dirty, so we cannot risk infection, the school nurse ordered. We'll take her to my office so Abigail can administer healing. Yes, ma'am. Midoriya looked up to see the two villains almost at the roof. Snipe had his pistol ready to fire, but the appearance of a student climbing the rope kept him from firing. Damn it, I don't want to fire with that kid there, he muttered. Snipe eyed Midoriya. You, get up there with that other one. I'll bring the rest to the roof through the staircases. Yes, sir. Midoriya powered up full cowl and leaped into the air. While he didn't get close to the villains, he did make some headway up the rope and climbed the rest of the way. Spinner slashed at the other student, causing him to splat on the window to avoid it. Once he did, Midoriya continued to race up the rope. The lizard villain cursed at him while silently admiring his determination. He slashed at the rope while also yelling at the remaining villains in the helicopter. Get us out of here. The two grunts grabbed the rope and began to pull them up. Midoriya latched onto a window sill while the remaining bits of rope fell to the earth below. He opened the window, helped his upperclassmen inside, and raced up the stairs toward the roof. He passed by several confused students and business teachers as he ran with full cowl active. He burst through the roof access door just as Toga and Spinner were climbing into the helicopter. Once inside, he could make out Toga and Spinner peering over and waving at him. Damn it. With the copter escaping, Midoriya had one idea in him. Powering up, he leaped high into the air in an attempt to catch them. And that's when it happened. In the future, Deku and the Chaos King were charging at each other with their fists raised high. The metal gauntlet that belonged to the symbol of peace was just what nature needed as an arc of lightning found its anchor. He sensed the bolt coming but did not act right away. The bolt of lightning struck the gauntlet as it traveled to the other. With one for all surging through him and the KO King's rage fueling his strength, the two energies collided as Midoriya thrust out his punch. Detroit. The punch never made contact with the Chaos King. As soon as the lightning traveled from him to the Chaos King's knucklet esters, the scene in front of the symbol of peace changed. Deku watched as a helicopter suddenly appeared in front of him instead of the villain blocking the attack. 
Inside was a shocked group of young villains. Smash, his punch connected with the helicopter, sending a shockwave through the aircraft and knocking all the villains back, being sent back the hardest. Toga lost her grip on the object she had grabbed from you. Uh, the device flew out of the helicopter and into the young Midoriya's unsuspecting hands. The alarms on the helicopter began to blare as Mr. Compress tried to regain control of the aircraft. The other villains were hanging on for dear life as the craft spiraled away from the school and toward the sea. The shockwave from the smash also negatively impacted the young Midoriya. While he did catch the hard drive, he was also knocked back and sent back to you as he plummeted. His scream of terror alerted his older self. Moving fast, Deku quickly blasted off with his power toward his younger self. The elder caught the young Midoriya and continued his course toward the roof of the building where several teachers and students were assembling. Deku swung his legs out and landed on the rooftop, skidding to a halt and dropping his younger self off. Some of the students immediately ran toward the young inheritor with Yuraka in front. Deku, wobbly from his traveling through the air, Midoriya simply extended his arms for a hug as the gravity heroine tackled him. He dropped the hard drive, only for it to be picked up by the elder hero. He walked over to where Snipe, Mr. Aizawa, and Nezu were. Merry Christmas Erasure. Mr. Aizawa cautiously took the hard drive from the hero. Brushing his hair back, Deku peered up into the sky. W-Wo. I, I didn't know he could turn into a helicopter. Puts a lot of things into perspective now. Principal Nezu was captivated. He quickly switched focus between the symbol of peace and the younger one being bombarded by praises and calls of concern. Well, that still doesn't, uh. Deku stopped and quickly examined the area. I I'm, I'm at UA. Nezu nodded. H how are you here? What happened? He asked. Deku shrugged. I don't know. I I was fighting the Chaos King when I. His words were cut short when All Might emerged from the stairwell. Deku's eyes widened, and some tears began to form. He shook his head. And no, it can't be. The former hero's eyes widened. Deku was in disbelief as he hurried toward All Might and wrapped him in a tight hug. All Might, I I can't believe. The old hero suddenly felt his heart grow heavy as he returned the hug. WH what the hell are you? The symbol of peace nodded. He broke the hug and smiled at his old mentor. I it's me. It's Izuku. Midoriya saw the interaction take place. I it's me. I'm your successor. In the future, Dynamite had just zip-tied the last crook and left him in a pile with his comrades. The explosive pro hero stretched his neck as he joined Kriyati at the gateway leading outside the base. So, you get it or what? The everything hero sneered before grabbing a flash drive from one of her pouches. I got what we needed, which was a lot. From the looks of it, most of his files are password locked in or encrypted. We're nowhere close to done, she said. So yeah, I got it. The explosive hero sighed. This shit is taking too long to wrap up. Deku said that we would be getting him here in tonight, he said. Yes, and while I'm sure that you have a loving wife waiting for you at home, I have to get ready for another commercial, Kriyati said. I thought you said you were done with that modeling shit. She shrugged. Unfortunately, I need to keep busy. Otherwise, I'm standing around the agency while doing nothing, she complained. Unlike you, I am constrained about how I patrol and fight. Dynamite laughed. And don't you forget who's the best. Kriyati rolled her eyes and turned away. After a moment of her teammate's laughter continuing to echo, she smiled and faced him. So that's Midoriya, right? The explosive hero's laughter quickly died down. His demeanor changed dramatically as he stared daggers at her while raising his hand. Say that again. She smiled. Gladly. Before she could, Yuravity came jogging up to them with a small, black book in her hands. Hey guys, I just finished checking the perimeter. There's no one else left, and all the Q-series rifles are still in their designated crates, she said. The everything hero turned her attention away from dynamite. Oh oh, that's great. They must have panicked and forgot to use them, Kriyati said. The explosive hero rolled his eyes. Good. The last thing I want is to fucking puke up my quirk, he said. Kriyati nodded. And the book. Gravity smiled waved the book. It's another one from our lovable spy, Omega. Incredibly. This guy has been in many meetings with the Chaos King. We've got some significant details in here, including supply routes, deployment schedules, blackmail on some politicians, and so on. As for why he had a journal lying around, your guess is as good as mine, she said. Dynamite smiled. So we have a shit ton of evidence to deliver then? Well, Gravity handed the to the book. Opening the book, Creaty and Dynamite flipped through pages of well-scribed notes and diagrams, as well as hand-drawn maps and sketches of everything from keypads to business logos. It seems that the Chaos King's influence is spreading. There are notes of businesses he owns in the United States as well as the UK, Italy, France, Saudi Arabia, and several African countries, the gravity hero said. Hmm, yes, strangely, he would even allow someone to keep notes of his meetings. Why would he do that? Dynamite rolled his eyes. His egotistical ass probably didn't count on being caught. He's got nearly the whole country on payroll, he said true, but it's still weird. 
also depressing, Creative mentioned. Even when we catch and arrest him, he has almost every judge in the country in his back pocket. He won't see a holding cell unless we get this all out. Which we can do, Iravati said. All of the Chaos King's bases that we've hit have had a black book of some kind lying around. Once we comb through his records, we should have more than enough power to take him down. And then I can get back home. Seriously, I feel like I'm missing a lot with the little ones, Dynamite said. The gravity hero nodded. She raised her hand toward her ear to call in. Deku, the site is secure. What's your status? BZZZZTBZZZZT The static that responded sounded nothing like the hero she knew and loved. Deku, Deku you there. More static. Dynamite growled as he tried his communicator with similar results. Hey, D-U-M-B-A-S-S. Pick up, damn it. Back you go. Creati exclaimed. What? He sometimes responds to that. The two continued trying for several minutes. Deku, Deku, in the present, much like his younger counterpart, Deku had tears swelling in his eyes after embracing his former master. The former pro hero found himself consoling his student by patting him on the back as if he were a father comforting his child, which was exactly what their relationship was. The younger Midoriya had looked up from his embrace with Yuraka as he finally got a good look at the hero that had saved him. I is that, D Deku, he looks like you. One of the students that had made it to the roof had rubbed her eyes before getting a second look at him. Damn, hey Midoriya, he looks like he could be your dad, she commented. Midoriya agreed, albeit noting the significant changes between their hairstyles. Back Hugo, not wanting to miss out on the villain attack, was also on the rooftop. What the hell is this? He asked. Deku smiled as he broke the hug. His eyes were still watery, but thankfully the waterworks had not been fully activated. He wiped away the tears while keeping his smile. So sorry, it's just that I haven't seen you in so long, he said. All Might smiled as he ruffled his elder successor's head. The wonders of time travel, probably. He turned his gaze to the younger Midoriya before returning to the elder one. By the way, what are you doing here? T that's a really great question, the elder admitted. One second, I'm about to smash the Chaos King's face in, and now I'm here. He gestured to the sky. I really just punched a helicopter. All Might laughed. Yes, yes you did, he said. Deku smiled turned his attention to the younger Midoriya as he and Yuraka were linked by the arms. The elder smiled as he approached his younger counterpart and knelt before him. He grabbed his tie and undid it. You know, after all these years, I can now see just how bad my tie-tying skills were. This is mainly why I go tie less at many galas, he said. As he expertly redid his tie, the elder looked up at his younger self. Part of being a hero is also being a properly dressed one. The pros are basically in front of the cameras all the time and must meet a specific set of circumstances. You gotta look good regally as well as heroically, though there are a few exceptions. Once the tie was correctly redone, the elder Midoriya ruffled his younger self's hair. Ask mom for some tips. I will say that they'll come in handy a lot. He rose and faced the few pros that were in front of him. I am Deku, the symbol of peace and number one hero of Japan. I need to speak to the teachers as soon as possible, Principal Nezu. Mr. Aizawa, however, looked unconvinced. Now, hold on a moment. The elder turned to the erasure hero. Now, we've seen a lot of different types of villains over the years. There have been mutant villains made from pieces of actual people. Then we've seen your godlike villains. And now you expect us to believe that you are the same problem child that broke both of his legs and arm during the entrance exam. Mr. Aizawa asked. The elder coughed as he hit a smirk. Well, those are some excellent points. Honestly, I would have been surprised if you believed me right off the bat, and I'm glad you're skeptical of me right now. But I am telling you the truth. He reached into his utility belt and opened one of the pouches. If you'll allow me, I have ID. He pulled out his hero's license and handed it to Aizawa. The erasure hero took it and inspected the card. If you scan that, the system will recognize that as a legitimate hero ID, accompanied by three-tier encryption that is identical to the same encryption as your ID. No villain organization can bother to copy a single line of code, much less forge an actual card, the elder Midoriya explained. Aizawa looked up at the elder successor. His gaze into Midoriya's eyes was met with the same. His emeralds met Aizawa's black pearls. I'm telling you the truth, Erasure. I would gain nothing if I weren't. Aizawa continued to hold the gaze for a few more minutes before he sighed. I'll get this thing checked out. For now, wait in the teacher's lounge, he ordered. The elder Midori about. Sir, he turned on a heel and walked toward the door where more students were poking their heads out. As soon as he made eye contact with a few of his old peers, he flashed them a gentle smile. Everything will be okay. Now, I may not have been in you, but for a while, but I can still smell Lunch Rush's food. I'd advise you guys to get back to your lunch, he said. The crowd of students was still staring in silence at the elder hero. Back Hugo's eyes were wide when he immediately recognized him. I is that. No fucking way. The elder Midori aside. 
He passed through the crowd and descended the stairs and toward the teacher's lounge. As he passed many of the onlookers, his gaze traveled back to All Might and he felt himself frown. Once he was gone, Mr. Aizawa and Principal Nezu addressed the crowd. All right, everyone, lunch is almost over, and I advise you all to either finish up or head to your next classes. 1A. I'm expecting you actually to listen for once, the Erasure Hero said. The crowd turned on their heels and descended the stairs. As they funneled their students through the emergency exit, Mr. Aizawa held back Midoriya and Yuraka for a moment. Kneeling to their level, he leaned in and whispered, Get that Janus stone thing you guys have. Once we know who he is, I want him sent back. The two looked at him and nodded before following their peers back down to the cafeteria. Principal Nezu reached out and took the hero ID card from Aizawa's hand to inspect it. His photo was definitely an older Midoriya, possibly in his late twenty seconds. His hair was shorter with a bit of a fade on his sides. His simple and caring smile was evident, a stark contrast to his first photo, which appeared as though he was being held at gunpoint. The hero ID number was legitimate, as well as the seal, the Prime Minister's signature, the office where he got the card, and the expiration date. A faint barcode could be seen in the background with a serial number for a manual scan. The principal sighed. It was going to be another one of those days. Deku sat on the couch opposite the chair that All Might used to sit on in the teacher's lounge. The tea machine was the same as he remembered and the few cups that came with it. Brewing a cup, the pro hero sat in silence. The silence was the opposite of comforting as the voice of his master rang in his head as clear as day. You have the heart of a hero, young Midoriya. I know that I've chosen a worthy successor. I made you a promise, and I intend to keep it. He felt the hand holding the cup of tea tighten its hold. Make me proud, ever since we met. That's all you've been doing. You have no intention to stop surprising me, eh? Trust your gut as well as your heart. Be the hero I know you are. Be the hero they need you to be. And then, as tears started to form in his eyes, My boy, Izuku, my boy. The cup shattered in his hand. He didn't register the initial sound. Instead, he noted the sound of his tea dripping onto the floor. He cursed to himself as he turned his arm, so his palm was facing up, and pressed a button on his wrist. The gauntlet disappeared into the snapping wristband revealing his deformed fingers and scars running up his forearm. He pulled out a cloth from his pocket and wiped away the tea. As he cleaned up the mess, his mind began to race. He kept hearing his words as clear as day as he picked up the pieces. Come on, come on. He muttered to himself as he threw away the pieces of the cup. As he began to brew another cup, he heard a voice behind him. Tea not suiting you, young Midoriya. The hero smiled and cleared away the tears that had formed. He turned to see All Might standing in the doorway with his hands in his pockets and a smile across his face. He rose to his feet as he pocketed the cloth. I'll pay for that, he said. All Might waved it off. I was planning on getting a new tea set anyway. Deku nodded in understanding. So, what's the verdict? The former pro sighed as he reached into his pocket and tossed him his hero ID. It all checks out, really. A quick scan reveals exactly the kind of encryption that we use for our IDs. The serial number is the same as your younger self, which is impossible to forge. Honestly, I think this whole thing is impossible, to begin with, he said. Deku nodded. And then some. Quite frankly, I don't remember most of this happening before, so I'm at a loss, he said. I think that to avoid any confusion between myself and my younger self, my hero name should address me. All Might nodded. Just like me, eh Deku? The pro hero smiled. So, you say most of this like you remember bits and pieces then? The blonde former pro said. Yes, it's mostly emotions for now, though I do remember being previously occupied with refining Master Shimura's quirk, Deku said. He demonstrated this by leaping backward and hovering a few inches off the ground, lounging as if he were in an invisible hammock. He willed the quirk to raise him higher until he touched the ceiling before landing gracefully in front of his teacher. Thankfully, I had a good teacher in the matter. Well, I should say teachers. All Might chuckled as he was given the teacup that Deku had. He toasted to his elder student. You seem so much more refined. The guidelines and expectations of a pro hero must have gotten to you pretty early on, huh? Deku smiled as a response. However, his eyes darkened as he turned away. It's partly the reason. As the former pro finished his drink, Snipe and Principal Nezu entered behind him. Deku bowed once they entered. Principal Nezu. I'm so sorry again for intruding like this, he apologized. The animal principal waved it off. Pish posh, young man. What's important is that everyone's safe. You saved us a great heap of trouble, however, he said. Snipe held up the hard drive that he had recovered. This contained an extensive list of medical information on our students. Specifically, the information regarding Class 2. Why the Paranormal Liberation Front wants this is unknown at the moment. Deku sighed. I remember. Shigaraki wanted the drive to clone it to access certain files. Mostly about my younger self. He said. If I remember correctly, you should keep an eye for any monitoring software. 
Can Shigaraki be spying on us? Spying on my younger self, specifically? See, he could track my younger self's progress with his other quirks. He would know when to attack and use whatever he wants, he said. I'd recommend cleaning the school's computers right away. Principal Nezu eyed all might as he set his cup on the coffee table. We will. Thankfully, Abigail Winters is still a genius in many technological regards, so I hope she'll shut him down. However, we should be cautious from here on out. The last thing we need is having our students in even more peril. And we cannot protect them, Nezu said, especially since eliminating your younger self is the best possible solution to his scheme. Deku nodded. I trust that Abai will get the job done. Of course, securing the school's servers will be a monumental task. It will take some time to fully secure that information, though it'll be worth it. Snipe spoke up. Of course, as for your arrival and housing situation, Principal Nezu believes you should be fine bunking with Tua for now. Of course, is it possible that the Janus Stone can send you back? Deku shook his head. It won't. Its power comes from displacements in space, not time. It would need something from a specific universe to work. And since I can recall some events from my older self traveling through time, it won't work, he said. If I am to return home, the circumstances would have to be reversed. Or there's someone out there with a time travel quirk. And until we have a solution, I suppose that you're stuck here for a little while, Nezu said. Perhaps you can pass on some of your teachings to the students if you can without revealing our futures. The symbol of peace nodded. It's possible. There are only a few events that I refuse to elaborate on, so it won't be a problem, he said. Principal Nezu eyed all might as Deku talked to Snipe. The former symbol of peace sighed as he turned to the new hero. They continued talking for a few minutes before they left the teacher's lounge. As All Might let his protege out the door, he noted that Deku had removed the left gauntlet at some point during the conversation. While there were scars on his hand, that wasn't what grabbed his attention. On his ringed finger was a golden band ring. When Midoriya and the rest of his class returned to their homeroom at the end of the day, everybody talked about the latest development, besides Yuraka and Bakugo. A few others from the class were on the roof when Deku first arrived. Everyone else got pictures, thanks to the other students that were there. Dude, you saw that, right? Kaminari bellowed as he shoved his phone at Siro. It's an older Midoriya. Gotta say the cape looks awesome. Yeah, I saw. Damn dude, you'll get buff. The tape hero said. Hiroraka and Ida, previously doing their own things, joined in the conversations. Yeah, Deku. All that training looks like it'll pay off. She said. Indeed. And he even said that he is the symbol of peace. Ida said. It's good that you aspired to do great things. Midoriya had his face buried in his desk. Gee guys, please stop it. Nah, come on, Midoriya. The way he took down that helicopter with no problem. That was awesome, Hiroshima said. One punch and he sent it flying. I bet those villains won't try to come back here again. He spoke in such a structured tone. I wonder how many years it's been for him, Yeyarazu noted. Midoriya rose his head. You saying that I don't talk that way? Yeyarazu smiled sheepishly as she rubbed the back of her head. T that's not what I meant, she said. The inheritor smiled and waved it off. I'm teasing. You know, Mina chimed in as she sat at the edge of his desk. He kinda gives off this sort of All Might-esque vibe. You get that too. Midoriya shrugged. Maybe being a pro helped him out. Well, yeah, there's that. But Endeavor doesn't give that vibe. And he's been a pro for a long time, she said. I mean, he's big, but not. You know, big. You get that. The acid-throwing hero wondered. Hey Yuraka, I bet you have to ward off fangirls in the future. Har har, the gravity hero said. Baby he's a speed type hero like Ada. Takoyami wondered. Ada smiled. It would be interesting to see that. With your quirk, you've definitely shown that you're pretty fast. Midoriya, he wondered out loud. Of course, who would be faster? Yuraka smiled, knowing just how little her boyfriend put into their jogging. Ooh, I wonder how he is with that black whip technique. She chimed in. Gyra looked mildly interesting. Good point. Hey Midoriya, you think he can do a better job than where you're at? Well, it would make sense if he's better at it. It hasn't been close to a year yet for me since I first developed it, and he had years. I'd imagine he thought of some new ways to use that technique in battle. He wondered. Meanwhile, Bakugo was fuming in front of him. He tried covering his ears to their conversation to no avail. The last thing he wanted to do was chime in and talk about the future Midoriya. But even more, he was fuming over what he said. A future symbol of peace. Bullshit. I am going to be the number one hero in the world. I'll definitely beat Deku. Look like your new gloves. What, did he outgrow them? Todoroki wondered. Probably. I mean, those new gauntlets look amazing. Those boots too. I'm missing the red ones though since they're what makes you. Well, you, Iraka said. Midoriya nodded. They kinda remind me of the full gauntlet that Melissa gave me. He noted. Definitely looks like an upgrade. Iraka smiled. To think, how many years later and you look so good as a hero. The cape isn't something I'd expect you to wear, Midoriya, Yeyarazu noted, unless there is a specific function to them. Well yeah, 
You see the old world comic books Yayarazu. All the great heroes wear capes. It made them look manly as hell, Kirishima said. Even some of the ladies wore them. Sue and Mina both turned toward the hardening hero. So, we're destined to be mediocre heroes because we don't wear capes? Mina asked. Kirishima looked at them and realized what they asked, prompting Bakugo to snicker at his desk. And nah, I didn't mean that. I am just saying that? Oh. Uh. Sue smiled at Mina as she turned to her froggy friend and winked. Sato doesn't wear a cape, and his cakes make him a true hero. Especially when we have cravings, the acid hero said. I can wear an apron and turn it backward, the baking hero noted. And Bakugo doesn't wear a cape. He already wasn't going to be a great hero with his attitude. But now that's a double whammy, Sue said as she gestured to the explosive boy. The blonde turned to her with a cold glare. Watch it, frog. See what I mean? Some of the class laughed as Kirishima tried to explain himself. He turned to the explosive boy who was trying to hide the obvious smirk on his lips. Be bro, little help. Fuck no, you're on your own. He started laughing as some of the girls closed in on the hardening hero. As they continued to converse among themselves, Deku, Snipe, and Principal Nezu were making their way toward the doors to the classroom. Had them set up some things a while ago, so you should be properly moved in by the time you guys wrap things up here, Nezu explained as he sat on Deku's shoulder. The pro hero beamed at him. Thank you, Principal Nezu. And thank you again, Snipe, for letting me stay with you guys in the meantime, he said. You're welcome, Deku. Honestly, I don't think there would have been a better way of addressing that problem other than having you here at the school, the cowboy hero noted. We can't have you staying in some hotel or something. And I appreciate that so much. I must admit, for a moment, I thought I was going to repeat Egypt all over again, Deku said. Snipe looked over at him. Egypt, what happened there? I had a nasty case there a few years back. Some growing terror cell had interrupted the Olympics, and we traced them to the country. I worked a joint opus with a few heroes in the region to take them down, he said. Had to sleep on the floor of some camp near Gaza. Nezu turned to Snipe. Joint ops are difficult, huh? The cowboy hero wondered. Deku smiled. Oh yeah, it was. Besides the obviously armed terrorists trying to kill me, I had to handle some Namu they had in the base. I know I went on a few ops with you, Snipe, and those were easier by comparison, he noted. But I saw more of the damage in my bank account. Yeah, too bad joint ops aren't all expense paid assignments, Snipe said. Nezu smiled. So, moving on from the topic, I'd like to address another. As you are aware, next week is the final exam for the students and the written exam is mandatory regardless of grade level. I hate those things, Deku muttered. But the combat exercise will be different. Now, I've been going over your idea ever since lunch, and I think we should do it. Of course, you would have to offer the exam to the other hero courses and not play favorites. The new simulation would definitely be refreshing and be as close to the true scenarios we face while on the field. True, and thank you, sir. Principal Nezu nodded. Now, shall we begin? The two heroes said nothing as Snipe pulled out his phone and sent a message to Yeirazu, telling her to get the class ready. Inside the classroom, the class president read the message and cracked a smile and waved at her VP, getting his attention. The inheritor immediately caught the mischief in her eyes as he shared her smile and nodded. She rose from her seat and approached the front of the classroom with a faint glow on her face. As Midoriya pulled out his phone, the class president turned to address the class. With a very familiar pair of glasses, making her best Ida impression, she pressed the glasses onto her face. Everyone, Mr. Snipe is approaching. Everyone quiet down and take your seats. She bellowed to the entire room. She even started chopping the air as she spoke. Everyone stopped what they were doing and talking about to look at the everything hero. Stunned silence filled the room before the not-so-subtle sound of Yuraka holding in a laugh appeared. Her face was turning red, and she started slamming her desk as Ida's face was one of stunned admiration. Midoriya was fighting a losing fight as he started laughing as he shut off the recording. Soon, the entire class joined him in laughter. A smile formed on Yeirazu's lips as she removed the glasses and placed them on the desk before returning to her seat. Jairo was in tears as she fist-bumped her best friend. The class president also got a few high-fives from Hagakir, Mina, Sato, and even Ida, who had to remove his own glasses as he wore the biggest smile on his face. As they started to quiet down, Yuraka shot her boyfriend a glance and motioned to her phone. Midoriya checked it to read the message, send me that as a PXD. Midoriya smiled as he prepped the message but stopped as the door opened and Snipe walked into the room. The last bits of laughter soon diminished as he stood in front of the whole class. He coughed before speaking. All right, everybody, I can see you're all enjoying yourselves, he said. Sir, she actually did it. I told you she would, Midoriya said as he held up his phone. Snipe chuckled and shook his head. T that you did. Remind me never to doubt you two again, he commented as some light laughter echoed through the room. After a moment, he continued. Alright, now, I have a few announcements before we conclude this week. First, your final exams are next week, 
and I don't need to remind you of what they pertain to. I also don't need to remind you, but I will anyway, that your mandatory training hours are due on Wednesday, the day before the written exam. You'll all be starting over in the fall with an adjusted amount of 24 mandatory hours before Christmas, you hear? Yes, sir. The class echoed in unison. Good. Second, I'm sure you're all very aware by now that there was an incident earlier during lunch. We can confirm that two individuals from the Paranormal Liberation Front were on the grounds and caused some commotion. Hader raised his hand. Sir, will this cause any problems down the line? He asked. No. Thankfully, their plan fell apart before any permanent damage could be dealt. A student was admitted to recovery girl's office after sustaining an injury, but she'll be alright. No lasting damage, thankfully. A few collected sighs of relief could be heard from around the room, especially coming from Midori. And finally, there will be an adjustment to your final exams. That got everyone's attention. At that moment, Nezu walked into the room with Deku behind him. As he walked in, the quiet muttering from everyone in the room filled his ears. Everyone was entranced at his close appearance. While most of them had only heard the rumor that he was on the campus, he had replaced his gauntlets on his arms. And with his cape close behind him, everyone saw that he looked like a hero from a comic book from the old world. Deku was gestured to stand next to the cowboy hero. Principal Nezu hopped onto his shoulder as the pro hero spoke. H hello, everyone. Deku waved at them meekly. Despite his appearance, many of the class were caught unaware. He's shy. So, first, I want to apologize for dropping in like this. I may have derailed some activities for you guys after the term has ended. But that doesn't mean we can't get the train running again, he said. Out of everyone, Midoriya was eyeing his future self the most. For one thing, he noted that he was pretty tall. And he didn't have the same bushy hair as he did. His was faded with some considerable length on top, so he didn't look weird. He also noted that, on his left hand, his thumb would occasionally rub against his ring finger. He also noticed the new hardware. His gauntlets were somewhat silver in appearance that completely covered his hand and his forearm. He looked down to notice that he wasn't wearing his red boots. Our next week, and thankfully the former trial wasn't set in stone, so... We talked it over, and it'll be changed this time as well, Deku said. Midoriya snapped back to reality. Now, the official terms for it won't be announced until Monday as some final details need to be worked out. But this comes from my own recommendation. The basic concept is that it'll mirror your first training simulation from last year, where two of you will be villains and the others will be heroes, but on a larger scale. I can vaguely remember how that simulation went if I'm frank. You shattered your right hand and had your left arm burned pretty bad. You were also injured from one of Bakugo's gauntlets when he fired a wave of fire at you, Nezu reminded him. Deku smiled. Ah yes. Now I remember. Some of the class chuckled. Anyway, once the final details are fine-tuned, you will all be notified of the practical part of your examination. I assure you all, it'll be fun, he said with a smile on his face. Nezu smiled and nodded. And while we focus on getting him back to his own time, he will need a place to stay. Snipe has agreed to use one of the spare faculty dorm rooms in your building. And while I'm sure you all will be wanting answers about what'll happen in the future, I won't be answering any personal questions about specific things, like hero rankings, who I'm working with, as well as some very sensitive cases that are, at this moment, ongoing, Deku said. Now, some stories I'll tell, but I'm not guaranteeing anything. Right, future knowledge can be dangerous and can change our guest here and everything he has experienced drastically. As much as we would like to know the outcome of many things, there is the knowledge that is forbidden to us for a good reason, Nezu explained. Deku nodded. I will introduce myself at the least. I am Deku, founder of the Tashinori Hero Agency in Musutafu, Japan. I'm 28 years old, and I became the number one hero at 22. My official debut will be a few years from now, but the circumstances will be kept to myself. Much like my younger self, I love pork cutlet, and recently I have been getting some dance classes and with a few old friends so I can somewhat move to a rhythm, he said. I've got two left feet and plenty of video evidence from my friends. Mina began snickering as he finished his remarks. Then, Deku clapped his hands together, alerting the whole class. Right. Well, the day is done, and the weekend is here. I'm sure you all want to head to the dorms, so. He turned to Snipe with a sheepish smile on his face. Can I? The cowboy chuckled. Go ahead. Perfect. Class dismissed. At that moment, the final bell rang. Everyone scrambled to their feet and left the classroom to enjoy their weekend, leaving Deku in the classroom. Once they were alone, the pro hero turned to the principal. Sir, I do have something to ask of you, he said. The principal turned to him. Hem, I will need the freedom to continue my work. As much as I would love to spend time here and relive my past, I was working on a case beforehand, and I need to chase after him, he urgently said. Could he still be in the future? It's possible that you came here on your own, Nezu said. Deku shook his head. I don't think so. When I arrived here, the entire world changed for me in an instant. 
If I was charging at him with my power as he was charging at me, then it's possible we both experience the same time jump. I want to be certain before I can think about relaxing. Nezu nodded. I understand. He pondered his request for a moment. All right, but you need to be careful. Tampering with time may have consequences that neither of us have thought about. You must be careful in not saying that you're from the future, he urged his former student. I understand. I can only hope that he didn't actually end up here as well, so my return to the future will be easy, but considering my track record with easy. Nezu smiled and nodded. Very well. Off you go, young man. Deku bowed and exited the room. Elsewhere, inside of an abandoned warehouse along the island nation's coast, a large section of one of its many walls had been destroyed thanks to a large object. The object, out of nowhere, blasted through the outer wall and into an 18-wheeler truck. The object burst through the vehicle and burst into another before resting inside. The object wore a nearly destroyed three-piece suit and golden knuckle dusters. Despite his sudden appearance and eventual resting place, there wasn't a single scratch anywhere on his body. The Chaos King groaned as he rolled over and picked himself up. Once he was on his feet and climbed out of the trailer, the villain rose and cursed himself. He looked around and found himself staring at the dry docks leading to the Pacific Ocean. He turned back toward the mainland and scanned the port. There were a few tall buildings, mostly abandoned based on the shattered windows and the graffiti. Abandoned shipping containers littered the port, as well as some heavy machinery. An abandoned container ship was docked at the port with faded paint, and several containers blasted open. He turned back toward the ocean and took a deep breath. The potent smell of salt water filled his nostrils. He shut his eyes, taking in the feel of the breeze brushing past him. He let his mind wander with the events that preceded the raid against his compound. Images of his warehouse and his soldiers being taken down by Ground Zero filled his mind before settling on one face. The face of Izuku Midoriya. He clenched his fists and turned away from the calming ocean. He stormed off of the port, frustrated at his predicament. As night fell on the world, the few members of the Paranormal Liberation Front managed to land just outside the city limits safely. Besides feeling shaken up at the sudden arrival of a hero, they were all also feeling dread. The mission had gone horribly wrong in just a moment. Not only had they been tagged by a student, but their primary target had given chase to them and nearly had them, and they would have gotten away had that hero arrived. As Spinner held the joystick that piloted the helicopter, Mr. Compress sighed as he kicked away some of the scrap metal. Well gents, that just happened, he said. Toga sighed as she stared into her empty hands. I, I had it. I had everything about Izuku. Spinner was pacing in front of her. W we can't go back empty handed. Shigaraki will definitely kill us this time. He panicked. He wouldn't. Mr. Compress coughed. Um, Toga, perhaps we should if that crazy hero hadn't jumped in out of nowhere and punched the drive out of my hands. We wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be down a hard drive, a helicopter, and two of our followers are currently either caught by heroes or dead. She bellowed out. Spinner eyed the helicopter. It would have been better if we had a teleport quirk with us. Or perhaps a critical member of the operation with a focused mind. Toga, you got distracted by that Midoriya kid again, didn't you? She looked up at them. I still got the job done, didn't I? Besides, you were no help. Bullshit. I kept those wannabe heroes at bay while you fucked around, waving at the kid. Oh, don't get high and mighty with me. Toga bellowed, rising to her feet. You admire him just as much. You let him go during the summer camp raid last year simply because Stain made a mistake. He did not make a mistake. Spinner defended his idol. Stain himself declared Izuku Midoriya and All Might as true heroes. They are the very people he respected above all else. To kill him then would have condemned the world to zero progress. Toga raised a brow. Damn, you love him more than me. Spinner's face burned bright. And no, I don't. Oh, you do well. She smiled. Spinner growled. Still, your bumbling cost us everything. I knew we should have left you back at the base. Is that so? Can you shapeshift into another person and work your way through an encrypted security system? No, Ben shut the hell up, she muttered while continuing to stare at her hands. You didn't decrypt the system, stupid. You plugged in a flash drive that malware made and pressed the go button, the lizard said. It is in the movies, Toga quipped. At that, Mr. Compress intervened. Ladies, gentlemen, I don't mean to sound brash, but I'll do it anyway. But there is a good chance that some hero is going to find us and take us to prison, so I'd suggest we slip out of here as soon as possible, he said, urgently. Toga sighed deeply as she picked herself up and brushed the gravel off of her skirt. As the trio grouped, Mr. Compress touched them both on the head and activated his quirk. With two little blue balls in his hand, the villain pocketed them and removed his villain garb to don a set of civilian clothes. The clothes were modeled after a beggar's rags, so he could slip in and out of the city without anyone being the wiser. Now dressed, the villain passed by the helicopter and gave it one last look. The vessel was in shambles with broken glass and an assortment of metal all over the place. His eyes gravitated to the nose of the chopper, 
and they widened. Embedded on the nose was an impression of a fist, and it looked like it was deep in there. On a whim, the villain brought his own fist and pressed it into the impression. Seeing that the impression was bigger only revealed that it was horrible and lucky that they survived. Shit, did All Might hit us or something? He asked himself. He shook his head. No time for questions as they had to report on the mission soon. The villain scanned his surroundings and fled from the scene of the crash. He ran out of the lot and hid just as a few police vehicles drove by as well as a bouncing hero. With their attention on the aircraft, Mr. Compress slipped into the closest alleyway and disappeared with a smile on his face. At the dorms, most of Tua was in the main lobby. Kaminari's switch was set up on the TV, much to the opposition of Ida and Yeyarazu. While some of their classmates took turns racing with Mario Kart, others were either engrossed in their own conversations or reading. In the case of Sato, Yeyarazu, and Midoriya, they were in the kitchens preparing for dinner. In the span of a few months, Midoriya's time as vice president was spent being Yeyarazu's companion in many things. Class meetings with the teachers ensured that they were the first to receive new information while also supervising the grocery schedules and chores list. As for cooking, well, that happened on a whim when the everything hero grew curious about the happenings behind cooking. Midoriya and Sato were glad to ease her along, at the expense of a pasta dish or two. As Sato put the side dishes in the oven while the stove was lit with bright blue flames, Midori sighed as he leaned against the counter. New recipe, eh? He asked the baking hero. Oh yeah, I grabbed it from my cousin, who was visiting America in the spring. They really like their carbs, he said. Should be good fuel for your quirk, eh yeah, Arazu. Oh yes, and with some modifications to my new technique, I should be able to have plenty of spare lipids for the future, she beamed. She turned to her VP and did a bow. Thank you again for helping me out with it. Although I assume that you benefited from those tests as well. She asked with a smile on her face. Midoriya chuckled. Well, it's mostly to help you out. I'll admit that using your quirk like that was a small thought when I first saw it in action. But you've come so far in such a short amount of time, he said. I it still looks heavy, though. Indeed. But I hope to implement some lighter metal panels while also cutting down on the more unnecessary bits. She said. But, don't you have another training session tomorrow? Yeah, Kirishima and I are going to be working on his unbreakable. My punches against his form should be interesting, he said. Yuraraka and Ashido are already going to be joining us if you want to stop by. Yeyarazu smiled as she briefly looked up. Yuraraka, recently outed at Midoriya's girlfriend, was sneaking up on the inheritor with a mischievous look on her face. She continued the conversation without alerting him. You and Sato haven't done anything yet, have you? Nah, there's no time, really, he said after glancing over and seeing the gravity hero getting closer. I'd love to, though, since we can see which of us has more force to our punches. Well, that's easy, especially with your very prominent muscles and taller physique. You have more mass to your advantage. And I'm sure you've been working out a lot more than I have, Midoriya said. Plus, you're pretty fast with your punches, which definitely adds to your strength factor. At that moment, Yuraka leaped outward and grabbed onto Midoriya by his shoulders. She had just cancelled her weight and used the counter to propel herself onto her boyfriend's back. Gotcha. W-H-A-A-A. Midoriya screamed as he leaped forward with Yuraka still on his back. Sato and Yeyarazu burst into laughter as the inheritor quickly realized who was on his back. Once he reached behind him and found her legs inching closer to him, a wicked smile crept onto his face. He grabbed her legs and gripped them tight against his body, and turned on a heel with full cowling activated. Before Yuraka could realize what happened, she was already blasted off toward the door and on the back of her boyfriend. Slipping through the door, Midoriya leaped down the steps and sped off toward the other buildings. With the gravity hero still clinging onto his back, he poured as much of one for all as he could into his legs and took her for a ride. Some of his classmates rushed to the door once they saw him leave to watch the spectacle unfold. They watched and laughed as Midoriya had turned a complete 180 and sped in front of the dorm. Everybody heard Yuraka as she screamed out, I see you, 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 you. Mina snickered as she jabbed at Gyro's side. Oh boy, she used his first name. She was grinning madly. Gyro smiled. He's gonna get it later. Be sure to put your headphones on just in case he makes it up to her, Mina teased. The punk rock hero groaned as she face bombed. Unfortunately, Ida had heard her comment and realized what she meant. Th that's unacceptable. That's vulgar. Mina turned to him with a wide smile. That's nature, Speedy. After a minute, Midoriya and Yuraka reappeared at the base of the steps of the building. Yuraka's hair was so far back that Gran Torino's air blasts could have caught her by mistake. She looked irritated as she pouted and shot daggers at the inheritor. The hero in question had no regrets as he smiled at her as wide as he could. As Yuraka began to pound on Midoriya's shoulder in retaliation, Deku appeared from behind the bushes in front of the building with a small plastic bag in his hand. Instead of wearing his hero outfit, he wore a pair of U.S. sweatpants and a black tank top underneath a hooded sweater. 
He peered over just in time to see the majority of the class standing outside and watching as his younger self received a punishment. He smiled and laughed, earning his younger self's attention. Iraraka stopped her assault on the successor and turned to see Deku standing there behind them. You know, I was wondering why I saw you breeze past me earlier, and now I know the reason, he said with a smile on his face. I almost lost my to-go box had I not braced myself beforehand. Some of the students all approached the couple. Whoa, man, looking good, Kirishima noted. Yeah, and out of costume too. What gives? Sato wondered. Deku smiled. Well, since my uniform is similar to my costume gamma, I figured it wouldn't have been a good idea to be walking around in that one, he said. Twelve years later, and the design still sticks. Midoriya understood his reasoning since he was the first to see the suit. Besides the gauntlets and boots, relatively little changed between his suit and his future self. I'm the cape, he wondered out loud. Well, Deku said, Mirio insisted that I wear one. He said it gives off the aura of a hero. I couldn't say no since he thought so too. He said this with a smile, causing Midoriya to smile as well. Anyway, I'm getting a bit hungry, so why not we all go inside and eat, eh? A collection of yes and I'm starving met Deku as they all walked inside. Once everyone was crowding the dining area, the symbol of peace was about to take the elevator to his room when he noticed that the television was still on. At some point, the switch was turned off, and the signal source was changed so they could watch the evening news. The promo art said villain alert and faded as the two anchors read their reports. Good evening. Today we're starting with some breaking news coming out of Musutafu, where a villain attack is currently underway, one anchor said. That's right. This incident was first called in about 15 minutes ago as police arrived on the scene. A villain is currently holding several people hostage and is keeping some local heroes from making any attempts to rescue them, the other said. We'll have a live feed broadcasting in just a moment. Deku, who had not made any advance toward the elevator, dropped his bag of takeout. He clenched his fists as he inched closer to the television. And then, in a moment, the feed had appeared. It showed an intersection where a few heroes were creating a perimeter around a very familiar villain. The heroes kept civilians at bay as the sludge villain, the first villain that he had ever encountered, kept several vehicles elevated off the ground and dangling them in front of the first responders. The footage grabbed the attention of several of the students, including Midoriya and Bakugo. As they approached the television, Deku crossed his arms as he made a decision. Hey, Izuku. He called out. The inheritor looked at his older self. I'm going to be a moment. It looks like I have work to do, he said as he turned away from the TV and approached the front door. Don't wait up, guys. Mina looked at the television and back at the elder hero. W wait a minute. Are you sure you can go out there? What if someone recognizes you? Deku turned to the acid user and smiled. It'll be fine. Besides, those people need help. And none of them are fast and agile enough to get them out of there without him noticing. Once the hostages are out of the way, there is nothing that can keep that villain safe, he said. He smiled at them. If I am going to be passing on some of what I know, then this is the first lesson, profile the repeated offenders. It'll make the ensuing fight a lot easier once you know what they'll be doing before they actually do it. He gestured to the villain on the tee. We take him for example. He uses his quirk to grab hostages because he knows that he'll break easily against a good hero. His form is entirely unstable, so as soon as he loses his hostages, he'll become desperate and attack. I'll use that to my advantage. The students all turned to each other before Deku smiled and disappeared. With the front door swinging wide open before closing, they all abandoned the table and crowded around the TV on the scene. The sludge villain continued to taunt the heroes that had arrived on the scene. None of them had the abilities capable of handling the villain as well as safely rescue the hostages. Instead, all they could do was keep the remaining civilians safe by being out of its reach. The villain bellowed out in laughter as he swung a sedan around, terrifying the mother and two children inside. Come on, heroes. Come and get them. Don't be shy. He taunted. Death arms and backdraft were on opposite ends of the situation. Both were keeping civilians from getting too close. Awa come on, what's the matter? Waiting for All Might to come in and save the day, are we? Well, tough shit. He's never coming to save the day again. You hear me? Those words caused the two heroes to flinch. Their hearts broke because they knew the truth. They only managed to win last time because of him, and he wasn't going to come with his retirement. The sludge villain once again let out a monstrous laugh. Fools, this is what happens when we depend on one hero to do the job. Without him, you're all stuck. Death Arms grimaced at his words. He was about to respond when he felt somebody try to push past him. As he yelled for them to stay back, he suddenly felt a strong gust of wind blow past him. The sludge villain didn't feel a thing as Deku arrived on the scene. With incredible speed, he leaped from a light fixture to one of the cars, tore through the vehicle, and emerged with a hostage in his arms. He repeated the action a few more times before he managed to grab every single hostage from their ensnared vehicles. He flew over backdraft and landed in a small clearing and dropped all the civilians off. 
Without anyone noticing, he leaped toward the light fixture and sat down over the sludge villain. It was at that point when the villain noticed that his cars were significantly lighter. What the? You know, holding these people up like this isn't what I'd call a healthy call for attention, Deku called out. Backdraft, death arms, and every single civilian in attendance all looked over to where Deku was. He waved at the people with only an innocent smile on his face. Some of these people have lives to get back to. And as someone who's had to work all day and commute home, I certainly wouldn't want to find myself suspended high in the air by a D-rate villain, he taunted. The villain growled. Who the hell are you? Deku shrugged. I'm the new kid on the block. Of course, I know who you are, you flubber ripoff, he taunted. The students back at the dorms all felt their jaws drop. Someone was live streaming the confrontation, so they had audio from the ground as well as the helicopter feet. Damn, that's gotta hurt, Hagakir commented. Sato nodded. Bakugo was watching the helicopter feed and smiled. Oh, this oughta be good. The sludge villain growled as he narrowed his eyes at the pro hero. What's up, buddy? It's been a while since I've been this close to you. A great many years, I'd reckon, Deku said. And, free. What, was there a crack in your cell or something? The villain raised one of the cars. Shut up, hero. It swung the car at the hero, seeing the attack coming a mile away. Deku disappeared before the car could crush the fixture. He reappeared a little further away and far from any civilians. Man, you must suck at whack-a-mole. Remind me not to ask you for help getting the stuffed unicorn at the fair, he continued to taunt him. The villain sneered as it raised another car. Shut up. It slammed the car down, missing him again. Deku continued to appear and disappear around the villain, taunting him with a bunch of I'm right here. Ass. As he continued to move, he noticed that the sludge villain's form became unstable as it couldn't hold together against his constant reappearances. The force of his movements was creating gusts of wind strong enough to break some of his body apart. Deku finally stopped while braced against the wall of a building. Man, you suck. I can't believe I almost died because of you. They don't make villains like they used to. The sludge villain's eyes flared. Damn you, heroes. He roared as he fired his remaining two vehicles at the hero. Deku smiled as he sped through the two projectiles and rushed the villain head on. With his fist poised for an uppercut, he got within inches of the villain before he struck back. Nobody saw it coming until it had arrived. Deku's arm moved in an uppercut, and contact was made right underneath the villain's jaw. The slam and crack from the impact were felt throughout the city as the sludge villain lost consciousness. He rose in the air before slamming down on the ground with a fist impression under his jaw. Everybody watched, including the heroes and the students at Tue. Bakugo was the most surprised as he rubbed his eyes in disbelief before staring at the screen once more. The sludge villain, the guy who surprised him and held him captive almost two years prior, was down in a single hit, much like how All Might defeated him before. He looked at Midoriya, who was watching with Yuraraka right beside him, and then back at the screen. S.H. S.H. Shit. He muttered. Bakugo, language. Ida blurted out. Eat my ass, glasses. Back at the scene, Deku had shaken the hand that he punched with as he looked upon his work. Everyone was still too stunned to react as the pro hero then eyed the hostages that he had just rescued. He approached them, passing through a few civilians as he walked until he made it to the group. One of them, upon seeing Deku, gasped, Why you? You saved us. Oh my god. Oh my god. I thought we were going to die, he breathed. Another one of them, a mother of her two young girls, looked on him with watery eyes. Th thank you, hero. She ran and hugged Deku, accompanied by her two children. Deku smiled as he patted the mother's head. After a moment, they all broke the hug, and the pro hero stepped back. I hope you all get home safe. I don't think there should be any other villain attacks but stay vigilant. All right. The civilians all nodded. As Deku checked around him, he saw a few people fishing for their cell phones. He needed to get out of there quickly before his identity was blown and his younger self's future changed. Checking that his hood was still up, he waved at the civilians before using his quirk to disappear further into the city. As the people left behind tried to grasp the situation, Deku made several detours before making his way back to Yua. He passed by some civilians that were already talking about his rescue and defeat of the villain. When he returned to the dorms, he was greeted by the entirety of Class 2A. They all turned to him and simply stared with wide eyes and hanging jaws. Deku chuckled nervously as he rubbed the back of his head. So much for getting started without me. Come on, let's eat then, he said. Kirishima gestured to the TV. D-dude, you just, with one punch, you took him down with no hesitation. He exclaimed. That was awesome. Nina bellowed. That was against the rules. Anonymously defeating a villain is on par with vigilantism. Ida barked. Hey, he saved those people in a blink of an eye, Kaminari stated. Yes, I'm sure that they are grateful, but now the public will be wanting to know who you are. It was reckless to charge in there. What if he saw you coming? Yeyarazu stated. As Deku scanned the crowd, his eyes set on Midoriya and Yuraraka standing by the screen, watching the playback. 
The gravity girl was pointing at the screen while his younger self seemed to be pondering the actions. Deku smiled at their interaction. You are guys. Hang on a second. Dude, you gotta share some of that, man. Kirishima asked. Bakugo scoffed. He doesn't have to explain anything. He's the number one hero in the future. He stated. Well yeah, but still. That'd be awesome. The pro hero chuckled. Well, as much as I would love to explain a few things. His stomach growled at that moment, startling some of the group crowding him. I haven't eaten since. Let's see. The raid started at around 9.30ish, but I was tied to that chair for about 3 hours, and before that, I barely had gotten a bite to eat at home before racing to the office, and since it's been another 6 hours since I arrived here. As he mumbled, Kirishima jabbed Midoriya in the elbow. Looks like you keep the mumbling after all this time, eh? He teased. Midoriya laughed. Deku then snapped out of his muttering. Right, I'm starving. Haven't eaten basically all day, he declared. He raced over to where he was standing before and grabbed his food. How about we have a nice dinner and just enjoy the end of the week? Heroism isn't a 24-7 profession, and you all need time for yourselves sometimes, he argued. Though he didn't wait for anyone to agree with him before he found a seat at the table, popped open his katsu and plate. He said his graces and began to eat, confusing the rest of the class at his actions. Out of everyone, Yeyurazu snapped out of it. Yes, it's time for dinner. Come on, let's eat before the food gets cold. Everyone snapped out of their confusion, and eventually, all joined Deku for dinner. Once everyone was served, the stress from the past week melted away. Everyone began talking about their weekend plans. Their excitement for their first class 2 final exam coming up, and their first exam with Deku. As everyone ate, Deku scanned the table. Everyone was laughing, eating, some were doing both at the same time too. But he didn't care about the visual of barely chewed food. He smiled as he began to answer a few questions from his past classmates. A smile that hit a broken heart. In less than two years, everything changes. They're lucky. He started tapping on the table as he ate. One, two, three. The next morning, when Deku woke up, he was greeting with a headline he was expecting to see. Hooded hero saves lives. Sludge villain defeated. He sighed as he read the article on his phone. Somebody did catch a picture of the ordeal, but thankfully his hood was up and his face was obstructed by the fabric. It was destiny that he was spared of such a thing as publicity. He continued to read the article, even chuckling a little bit when the chief of police demanded that the hero reveal himself. Failure to do so would force us to consider him a vigilante and, or an unregistered quirk user the chief said in a statement. Switching to his normal morning routine, the pro hero sighed as he flipped into the air. Using float, he stretched his entire body, feeling his muscles expand and release the tension from the previous night. He heard several pops from his joints as he felt his body loosen up. Once he was satisfied, he disabled float and used black whip in both arms to keep himself suspended. With his lower body stiff, the symbol of peace started to do some modified pull-ups. After a while, he took a deep breath and heard the ceiling above him start to creak. The area where black whip connected started to crack as debris started to fall. Deku only smiled and continued his exercise, now feeling the strain in his arms and core. After a while, Deku disabled Black Whip and dropped to the floor. As he did, however, the floor beneath him nearly gave way and collapsed. The symbol of peace winced as he stayed still for a moment before straightening out. He let out another deep breath and left the room, leaving behind the ring he brought with him on the bedside table. H slipped down to the common space to see some of his younger friends already up. Ada and Midoriya had just come back from a morning jog. Mina was hanging over the couch's armrest, looking as dead as could be while Kirishima was in the kitchen making coffee. He chuckled as he watched them all interact with each other before entering the room. Midoriya was the first to notice his older self. Oh, hi Deku, he called out. He flinched as the words exited his mouth. Well, that feels weird to say to someone else. Deku laughed. You'll get used to it, he said. Morning everyone. His laugh caused Mina's near-dead form to jerk just a little bit. Hello. There's two of you Midori. Your Araka must be Suo happy she muttered. Midoriya felt his face burn bright red. And Mina, A-H-S-I-D-O. That's very inappropriate of a you. Eh, student? She laughed as she tried to pick herself up. Yes, it is. She looked up at him and smiled. But it's funny. No it's not. Deku checked his phone. Man it's early for them to be up. Maybe Ida and my younger self woke them up. He looked up to see Kirishima waving at him. Hey Deku, you're up early. I could say the same for all of you. What's going on? Mina yawned. I got, like, no sleep last night. Studying for those exams until 5 in the morning sucks. She complained. Hiroshima agreed by nodding. Might as well wake her up and get some coffee ready. Mina threw her arms into the air and cheered. Here, I'll help. I need a cup too. Deku offered as he crossed the room. Hiroshima chuckled. Oh well, really? Deku chuckled. As a pro hero who has to wake up early every morning and possibly stop a store robbery or two on the way to work, I find coffee a true blessing upon the world, he said. 
Midoriya smiled as he watched the exchange. So, we're neck and neck now, huh? He asked Ada. Indeed, I'm gonna have to train harder to widen that gap between us, the former class rep stated. The inheritor smiled. Yes, and I cannot wait for that, he said. It sucks that I can't tell him I'm only putting in 45% of my power into our morning runs. If I may ask, how are you and your Uraka doing? Ida asked. Midoriya chuckled. We're doing good. We're going to see a movie tonight after we put in some training hours for Snipe, he said. I see. Even as you as students, you two will just go out like that. Ada wondered. Well it's not a bad thing. We're not just students, Ada, Midoriya said. True, but the Paranormal Liberation Front is still out there. They can strike at us at any moment, he argued. They seem to like you more than the rest of us though. Deku peered over his shoulder while he was helping with the coffee. Van, I haven't heard of those guys in a while. Midoriya shrugged. Don't know why. Ada nodded. Yes, well, as your friend, I don't think putting yourself and your Raka in harm's way for a date is a good idea. It's possible that anyone under their influence may strike at any point, he warned. Midoriya was about to retort when he heard his older self chuckling at the coffee machine. Hiroshima was watching with confusion as Deku set his mug down for a moment. Hey man, what's so funny? Deku turned around and patted Kirishima on the head. Oh it's nothing. Honestly, I completely forgot about the PLF until just this morning. It's been so long since I heard that organization's name, he admitted. Oh, Ida chimed up. What happened to them in the future? Deku's smile faltered. Well, they were defeated in Tokyo. They went down quick after the heads of the Hydra were cut off and burned, he said. Man, that was a day. Wait, Tokyo, why in such a populated place? Ida wondered. Deku didn't answer, instead he grabbed his mug and took a sip. Deku, he shrugged. What? Ida waved his hand. Why Tokyo? Because that's a very important city. The capital city is a very important location for an attack, striking at the politics and the culture of the whole country. Shigaraki thought that by taking the city, he could end the whole war between us by installing a loyalist in the prime minister's seat, he explained. But that's also heavily saturated in hero agencies. To even consider an attack on the capital would mean having a lot of troops to go and fight? Ida argued. Deku smiled. You're right. What? You didn't think Shigaraki was going to take the stalemate like an angry preteen, did you? He slipped into the shadows, gathered the remaining remnants of all for one's old criminal empire and inspired more to his cause. He had the numbers, the drive, and the power to steamroll through the city and he would have succeeded too if we didn't stop him. The pros. Deku nodded. But, that's not important right now. Today will be a busy day. He said. But Deku turned to the speedster hero. What did I say? He asked. But I'm still confused. Why would Shigaraki risk capture by walking through Tokyo? I indulged you with answers, and now I'm asking you to drop it. But enough Tenya. He froze. Deku sighed as he sipped his coffee. Look, I gotta get some clothes since I'll be here a while. Maybe get my suit fixed because I'm pretty sure I found a few new tears. I also have to go over my ideas for the final exam for you guys with the heads of the hero course. As it turns out, I can't exclusively teach what I want to teach to just you guys. But what a boo Midoriya. Don't worry about tonight with Acha. Iraraka, if I remember this time period correctly, the PLF is still licking its wounds from the recent battle. Even with some heroes within its ranks, they've been outed as being part of a villain organization. They won't get close to you guys without being recognized, Deku said. Really? Deku nodded. Now go on, go get ready. You have a day ahead of you too, right? Midoriya nodded. He said his byes to his friends before he raced back upstairs. Once he was gone, Deku sighed heavily and set his mug down. Kirishima turned to the future hero. You okay? Mina picked herself up and shuffled to the two in the kitchen. Yeah, just. He eyed the two students while also glancing at Ada, who was still at the entrance of the building. It's nothing. I just remembered how exhausting that day was. Yeah sure, just feeling exhausted doesn't warrant that kind of reaction, Ada said as he entered the room. No, but then again, it's my story to tell. I shouldn't have mentioned anything, Deku said. He waved his mug at them, gesturing them toward the stairs. Go on and get ready for the day. As much as I miss lounging around, there is always work to be done. Manage your time and you'll reap the benefits of your decision. The students all nodded in agreement. Deku smiled at them. All right now, off you go. I need to fill out some paperwork real quick, he said. Uh, sure thing, Kirishima said. After he grabbed Mina's coffee mug and handed it to her, they all ventured upstairs. Deku sighed and quietly sipped his coffee. After a few sips, he set the mug on the counter and punched the refrigerator, making a dent on the side. Mina hadn't gone up at the same time as Ida and Kirishima, so she was the one who saw his outburst. Something else. She could swear it was just the exhaustion making her hallucinate, but it looked like the pro hero's arm had some fire coming off of it. When Deku returned to his room, he groaned as his back hit the door. He pinched his nose and took in a deep breath as his free hand started tapping on the wood behind him. He quietly started muttering numbers as he tapped. 
1, 2, 3, get back here, 4, 5, 6, murderer, 1, 2, 3, damn you, I'll send you to hell, 1, 2, 3, all for one, Deku's eyes shot open, he slid down to the ground and buried his head into his knees, tears started to fall as he sat there, remembering that horrible day in Tokyo, the day he became the symbol of peace, meanwhile, the giant of a man, the Chaos King, strode through the city in his dirty three-piece suit. Many civilians that passed by him turned to gawk at the man with some believing him to be a villain right off the bat. They weren't wrong, however. The head of the Discord organization passed by a hero agency, currently occupied by a flood of reporters all clamoring for information from Death Arms. The hero and the reporters paid no attention to the half-giant as he passed them, though he did happen to hear one question out of a sea of clamor and confusion. Where is the hero that saved the seven hostages and defeated the sludge villain? The question was repeated several times, each time being ignored or deflected by the pro-hero. With each instance the question was asked, the villain grew more intrigued at the story. Clearing his throat, the man tapped on one reporter in the far back. Excuse me, he said. The man turned and found himself staring straight up. His eyes widened as the Chaos King's curious and stern gaze met his one. You um, excuse me, but I'm new in town and I can't help but notice something's going on. What happened last night? The villain asked. The reporter gulped nervously. S.C. Sir, you haven't heard. The Chaos King shook his head. S.S. So, last night, a villain took several people hostage in the middle of the street. So so some guy came by and saved them all before BBBBBB beating the villain in one hit. The reporter stammered, obviously not used to someone towering over him. Oh, one hit. That's amazing, the villain said, feigning excitement. The reporter nodded. H. He kinda reminded us of a All Might, he said. Is that so? The Chaos King smiled. The reporter nodded furiously before returning his attention to the pro-hero in front of him. Death Arms continued to deflect questions regarding the hero from the previous night. However it was soon becoming a losing battle for him. The Chaos King eyed the hero in front of him. The hero continued trying to explain that the investigation was ongoing. But before he could move the conversation to something else, Death Arms looked over and met the villain's gaze. The Chaos King smiled as he stared at the hero. You were my first bother but not even close to my last. Your quirk is a wonderful thing at the least, he thought to himself. The villain waved at the hero before turning and walking down the street. As he walked, he passed by two teenage girls with their phones in the air, trying to snag a picture of death arms as he was answering reporters. They both didn't bother with the man, possibly because his size wasn't completely unusual. He passed by a fruit stand where several copies of the morning edition of the paper were sorted next to the cashier. The Chaos King swiped one copy away and began to read it, much to the protests of the cart keeper. Immediately, his eyes gravitated toward the date at the top corner. Shit. This isn't good. Twelve years into the past. Impossible, he thought to himself. Sir, you gotta pay for that. The keeper continued to call out to the villain. Well, at least the Griffins are winning. Though if I remember this year correctly, that'll change in the playoffs. He muttered to himself. Sir, now then, what is this about a hero winning against a villain last night? He checked the front page, and when he did, he nearly choked on air. The featured picture showed a young man in a hoodie and sweatpants standing over the pile of goop that was the sludge villain. The Chaos King scanned the picture over and over, telling himself constantly that his eyes were playing tricks on him. Though, in the end, he tore the picture from the paper and pocketed his souvenir inside his jacket. He then crumpled the paper up and tossed it into the street, bouncing off of the windshield of a passing car. He then turned and walked away from the cart just as a local hero was brought to the scene by the cart keeper. If that's who I think it is, then I have a serious problem, he muttered to himself as he walked. Then again, if I did travel 12 years into the past, then that means my crew is still in the area. He smiled as he ducked into an alleyway. Gonna have to take care of the current boss, but when I do, Deku will be next. Although, freeze, the Chaos King sneered as he turned to face the cart keeper and the local hero. A man with arms made of bricks and with three fingers per hand stood with them both raised in a battle stance. You there, where do you think you're going? The hero demanded. The villain raised a fist to the hero. Perhaps what I should concern myself with is which Deku I should kill. He then lunged at the hero. In an undisclosed location, a small group of men wandered around a spacious warehouse, where numerous boxes filled with unseen goods were lying in wait for someone to release them. All of the men inside wore variations of striped vests and slacks, reminiscent of the late 22nd's gangsters in America. Instead, they wore no hats, and each one of the men wore a patch on their right shoulder, a single dot with arrows branching out in all directions. While only a few of the men were human-esque, one was larger than the rest. The man's quirk defined his image, and his image was that of the lion. His upper body strained in the three-piece suit, nearly tearing the fabric at the arms and upper torso. 
His head was of a lion's head, complete with a flowing mane and piercing red eyes. His hands were instead claws as he tapped them on the boxes as he walked. His eyes scanned the room, eyeing several particular boxes. Well, what happened to my shipment? The lion man asked. One of the men in the room approached him. He was fully human, with pipes protruding from his arms. One of his eyes wasn't natural. Instead, they looked like the inside of a mechanical watch. As sir, it seems that it's purposefully being delayed. Our contacts in the PLF are withholding payment until we complete a job, he reported. And that job is, er, well, it seems that there was a heist job at that hero school. And they want some specific data from there, the man said. They want us to continue the mission, or else we're down a set of ivory tusks. The lion man rolled his eyes. This Shigaraki guy is starting to piss me off. And stealing something from UA is a surefire way of getting thrown in prison. I I believe they know that, sir. The lion man groaned. Send in a bird. I want to know what we're looking at, he ordered. And start sifting through all of this junk. I want to be making a damn profit here. Why yes, sir. As the reporting guy left to gather some of his comrades, the doors to the warehouse burst open. The lion man looked up to see two men with similar suits run into the room. One of them had ram's horns protruding from his head and some fine fur underneath his collar and sleeves. The other was a regular human with a chubby face and a bald head. The ram man fell to the lion's feet. E boss, I'm sorry. The boss glared at him. Sorry for what? The pudgy man dropped next to him. W we were out casing a joint when we saw a hero and a shopkeep guy run after one of our guys. We ran to help him out, but, but, what? The lion man demanded. W we're so sorry. He wasn't one of us. He was wearing the suit and the pen, so we thought. The ram man said. W we saw him wipe the floor with the hero before he could call for backup. He saw us, and we ran straight here. Did you lead him here? The lion boomed. Yes. A voice boomed. The lion man and his two lackeys turned towards the entrance to see a half-giant stroll in with a hero slung onto his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. He walked with grace and authority, immediately claiming the room as his as he eyed the lackeys near the crates. His knuckles had some evidence of blood on them, suggesting the brutality of his beating of the hero. As he approached the lion man, he gave him a snarky stare and smirk. He raised the hero and dropped him onto the ground at the boss's feet. The hero groaned, indicating that he was still alive. The lion man looked down at the hero for a moment. He was a reasonably unimpressive hero. However, he disrupted most of his sails in the area. His quirk allowed him to strike hard with his brick-like body. While he wasn't as strong as Death Arms or any other pros, his strength in mind was admirable to the neighborhood he protected. The Lion Man looked up at the Chaos King. So, you took down a hero, he said. The Chaos King crossed his arms. Suppose I did. Don't be expecting me to trust you. I know you're not one of us, the Lion Man declared. Perhaps, but that can change quickly, the Chaos King remarked. From what I can remember, you guys have hit a low in recruitment. He walked over to one of the crates. He grazed the box with his hand and smiled. You're barely scrounging up supplies after the shy Hasekai fell. What few guns remain on the open market are here, as well as a small loan of trigger from the factory, correct? The lion man growled as his eyes narrowed at the newcomer. How do you know that? The Chaos King turned to him. Those reasons are my own. But I am not wrong, right? And even now, your guns for hire. Cannon fodder to something stronger. He turned to the current boss, the Paranormal Liberation Front. I didn't realize that we sold out to those pathetic losers. They protect us, the lion man sneered. The heroes may still be licking their wounds from that battle, but there are still a lot of them out there. You're right, but for how much longer? The Discord organization is the top villain society globally, and I will be damned if it continues to wither like this. Your fears are holding them back from fortune and power, he declared as he gestured to the lackeys in the room. The lion man watched as his crew started to converse among themselves. He glared at the newcomer. You dare suggest that I'm unfit to lead my crew? The Chaos King shrugged. It's not leading when you're obeying the orders of a child king like Tamura Shigaraki. You seek to survive, I strive to prosper. He bellowed out to the crew. More murmurs echoed throughout the room. The lion man growled as his crew simply stood by and debated against him. He glanced down at the hero on the floor and back up at the Chaos King. So is this your declaration? Do you wish to challenge me for leadership of this crew? The Chaos King smiled. Oh, I do. The Lion Man reached up to unbutton his jacket and throw it to the floor. The Chaos King smiled and copied his action, revealing a hidden holster underneath with a pistol inside. The Lion Man didn't say anything before the Chaos King removed it and tossed it on the hero. Two lackeys quickly ran in, grabbed the hero, and dragged him in the gun away. The Lion Man walked up to him and held his arm out at his opponent. Standard rules apply here. No weapons, the boss declared. The Chaos King smiled as he removed his golden knuckle dusters and pocketed them. He shifted to a combat stance opposite of the boss. Ready. The boss sneered. Die for your insolence. One of the lackeys waved for them to begin. 
The boss ran on all fours and pounced at the Chaos King, his fangs bared at his opponent. With his claws extended, the Lion Man swiped at his opponent, hoping to draw blood. The Chaos King dodged backward at the last moment, only allowing some of his suit to be torn from the attack. He continued to elude backward as the Lion Man continued to slash at him. The lackeys watched as the fires burned within the boss's eyes. Whenever he went on the attack, his quirk's beastly nature would kick in, leaving him blind to the world around him. The object of his hate directly in front of him. The boss continued to slash away at him, hoping for the lucky strike. The lion man continued to press forward toward his enemy, his talons inching closer and closer. He slashed through his shirt, exposing his ash-gray skin. There was evidence of some faint scars crossing his chest. The boss redoubled his efforts and continued his advances toward his foe. The lackeys watching were all on the edge of their seats. The Lion Man had been the boss of their organization for many years, taking multiple contracts and keeping the ship floating, especially after All for One's first defeat by All Might. While his defeat blew open the doors on the criminal underworld, the Discord organization stayed relevant by willingly fracturing its ranks and spreading them throughout the region. While the main facility stayed relatively strong, the others had unfortunately met the same fate as the Shai Hasekai. While some of the lackeys watched the Lion Man and quietly cheered him on, a few others did the same for the Chaos King. They noted his strength and powerful aura as soon as he walked in, unafraid of the heroes outside. Even bringing an unconscious hero and declaring an open challenge to the leadership was something they didn't expect when they woke up in the morning. They watched the Chaos King avoid the Lion Man's punches without a hint of fear in his eyes. One of the lackeys had the quirk to sense emotions in close targets, and the Chaos King wasn't fearful, nor was he even concerned with the fight. As the fight continued, one of the lackeys twitched his head to the side and smiled. He whispered his boss's name, causing the Chaos King to feel a sharp itch form on the back of his head. The feeling caught him off guard while the Lion Man lunged in with his claws aimed at his eyes. Gotcha. He bellowed. His claws slashed downward from his hairline down at an angle and crossing out his eyes. At least, it was supposed to cross out his eyes, but it didn't. The Chaos King sealed his eyes as soon as he saw the claw come close. The Lion Man's attack made contact, causing sparks to form as his claws effortlessly and harmlessly scraped off of his face. The Lion Man's face fell as the Chaos King smiled before looking back at his opponent. The lackeys all watched as the boss's opponent suddenly reel his head back and head but the Lion Man. The attack sent the boss flying back and had him sliding on his back. Two of his lackeys ran over to help him up, but the boss raised a hand to stop them. No, don't you dare. They stopped as the boss picked himself up. He rubbed his forehead as he looked up to see the Chaos King saunter over toward him. You, what is this? Your quirk. The Chaos King nodded. Love it, right. It's called sticks. I hope you like how it feels, he said. The lion man spat out some blood and raised his claws. That quirk won't keep you alive forever, he declared. I'll tear through your body until I find your weakness. The Chaos King smiled. I doubt that. The lion man lunged forward with his claws out. He slashed at his opponent with renewed determination, searching for the anchor point that made him vulnerable. The Chaos King smiled as his shirt continued to be slashed up, revealing more of his ash-gray body. His slashes made contact with his skin, continuously scraping against it as if his body were made of stone. After a while, the Chaos King decided to fight back. He grabbed the Lion Man's wrist as he continued to slice at him and jammed his fist into his face. The crunch that followed was a sound everyone heard in the room as the Lion Man stumbled backward. The Chaos King advanced and started his attack run. The lackeys could only shield their eyes as they watched the fight shift dramatically. The Chaos King was a powerhouse, a living tank against the boss. His punches always hit their marks. The boss couldn't stand on two feet for long before being tossed around like a sack of potatoes. His head spun around as he continued his assault. Not relenting from his slaughter, the Chaos King backed the boss to the wall, where he barely regained consciousness. The giant towered over his helpless victim with his fists clenched and his glare shooting daggers. And I believe I win. Unless you want to try again, he said in a calm, low voice. The now former boss looked up at him. Why you're impossible? The Chaos King nodded. I refine my power at an early age. No spiritual tether keeps me, mortal. Only my convictions, he said. As for you, your crown is mine as well as your life to do with as I please. The Lion Man's only working eye, since the other couldn't open, widened in horror as the Chaos King walked over to his jacket and the gun he carried. The lackeys watched as he pulled out a sort of futuristic pistol, mostly silver and sleek with Tesla coils all around it. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a steel flask. The lackeys watched him pocket the flask and turned a switch on the gun. Trust me, you'll wish I killed you, he said. The Lion Man shut his eye waiting for the end. The Chaos King aimed and fired the gun, shooting an electrical beam at the former boss. The former boss screamed as he felt the arc surge throughout his body, entrapping the lackeys in awe and horror. When the Chaos King eased off the trigger, he holstered the gun and pulled out his flask. 
He opened it up and held it to the lion man's mouth as he started to feel sick. He began to heave as his body convulsed, instinctively holding onto the flask as he felt something come up. Everyone in the room turned away except for the Chaos King as he let it out. Instead of what he was expecting, which was his breakfast, the lion man saw a rainbow stream pour from his mouth and into the flask. He tried to move it away, but the Chaos King held the flask in place. The rainbow stream continued for a moment before it stopped flowing. At that, the Chaos King pulled the flask away and sealed it shut. The lion man looked up with wide eyes. W what was that? The Chaos King smiled. The end. The lion man didn't say any more as he started to feel the change. He raised his hand and saw it twitching wildly. The feeling extended up to his arm and throughout his entire body. His injuries had persisted as he felt new ones take form. His fingers felt like they were shrinking, his mane molted off of him, and his shirt started to feel bigger. He watched the Chaos King smile as his vision declined. W what did you do to me? The Chaos King shook his flask. I call it, Q-Series. It's a quirk isolation and forcible extraction piece of tech that liquefies the quirk factor in any person and forces the body to expunge it, thinking it is a disease that must be purged, he explained. The lion man watched his claws disappear, and human hands form. Without your quirk factor, you are just a normal, pathetic quirkless man. You are lesser than the dirt I crush under my boot, he said. The former lion man looked up. He was a lightly tan man with only his ruby eyes remaining from his quirked form along with some long hair. Your quirk is mine to do with as I see fit. You're done, the Chaos King said as he turned away. With one cold glare, all of the lackeys in the room stood and bowed before the new boss. He raised the flask and smiled. We will rebuild the Discord organization from the ground up. Hero society will fear our power throughout the world. And all good things start at home, he announced. Everyone stayed in their bow, too scared to say or do anything. The Paranormal Liberation Front will rue the say they underestimated us. As of today, we will terminate all of their contracts. He grabbed a stack of papers on a counter and tore them as if he tore a leaf. We will make our money our way. Reach out to our contacts on the streets and have them push out more trigger. Resupply at our warehouses and start controlling the market. Three of the lackeys rose and saluted. Take to the streets. Our numbers must grow if we are to fulfill our new quotas. Another group rose and saluted. The Chaos King walked over to the hero he brought in and pressed his foot at the small of his back. As for the hero, two lackeys looked up to watch the new boss press hard against his back, crushing his spine. Make sure he's found. He won't be of any use to us anymore. The two rose. The Chaos King turned to the former boss and smiled. This is a new day for the Discord organization. I am your king. Long live the king. All the lackeys in the room raised their fists high in the air. Long live the king. The Chaos King smiled and approached his victim with his fists clenched. The former boss shut his eyes as the last thing he saw was the stone fist of his successor slammed down on him. While the sun was not due to rise for another half hour, Snipe was still up early in the morning. His morning routine was always the same. He brewed his cup of coffee after he did his morning stretches and settled onto his balcony. He would strum his guitar quietly as he would watch the sunrise greet him. He put away his quiet hobby when all was said and done and slipped down to the common space. When he got there, he expected to see Midoriya and Yayorazu waiting to begin the daily overview. As class president, Yayorazu had the entire class's daily schedule, including possible exams, lunchtime changes, hero training time slots, exam results, and many other important notices. With Midoriya as her VP, they managed to keep their class schedules clear and clean for everyone to use. When Snipe entered the room, Neither of the two young heroes in training were there. Instead, there was Deku in his hero outfit standing in front of the TV. His silhouette cast an imposing shadow on the front entrance. His arms were crossed, and his attention was focused on the images. The Western pro was about to ask him what was going on when he called out. Sorry, Snipe, I know it's early. He said. Snipe jolted as he met the elder Midoriya's glance. He muttered a curse as he shook his head. You scared me. He said. Deku smiled. Sorry about that. I wanted to speak to you in person, but I also needed to see this. Plus, you strumming your guitar is a symphony that shouldn't be interrupted, he said. Why you heard me? I try to stay as quiet as I can. Deku gestured to his ear. Enhanced sense from the sixth wielder of one for all. Any of the five senses are heightened at the expense of the other four, he quickly explained. With the core unlocked, I learned to strengthen two senses while sacrificing only three. Beneath his mask, Snipe's eyes widened. Damn, Deku turned to the pro hero. Anyway, there's something you need to see. I've already asked Principal Nezu and All Might to join us, so we'll be heading over. Over to where? Also, it's a school day. I need to get my students Riyayorazu and my younger self will take care of things. You and I both know that Kreati is a great leader, Deku said. Snipe had to agree. Besides the fact that everyone listened more to simple instructions, the class's overall test scores improved from the prior year. 
There wasn't even a need to hang a summer school threat over their heads. Mr. Aizawa grumbled when he learned about their test scores, though he smiled as well. He was proud of his former students. Snipe nodded, prompting Deku to shut off the TV. A symbol of peace pulled out a note explaining their absence and set it on the dining room table. They left the building soon afterward. When they arrived at their destination, All Might was waiting for them in the parking lot, sitting in his old truck. Principal Nezu sat at the edge of the bed with his feet dangling and swinging, much like how a little kid would. With the car parked and the heroes out, the four of them entered the building. The city's morgue was a relatively small building, gated with two entrances and an ambulance port on the side. Several police cars were parked around the area, with some of them chatting with costumed heroes. The building was a simple three-floor facility with an above-floor lobby. Two lamp posts were situated at the front on opposite ends of a set of double doors. When they walked in, Tsukachi and another detective were talking to a uniformed police officer. As soon as the officer saw the former symbol of peace, he saluted the two detectives and left to continue his work. This prompted the two to turn to the heroes that walked in. All Might, what are you doing here? Tsukachi wondered. The former pro shrugged. I was just told to come here with Principal Nezu, he said. Nezu nodded. Deku, what's going on? The detective looked at Deku with wide eyes. W wait. How? Deku smiled. Time travel. Accidental, of course, he said. The other detective looked at him with a raised brow. You've got to be joking. There isn't a single registered time travel ask quirk. Tsukachi shook his head. No, I know Deku. I've met the young Izuku Midoriya some time ago. So you know that I'm telling the truth, Deku said. I've never lied to you, sir. I don't plan on starting here and now. Regardless, I have to ask why you're all here. This case has nothing to do with you, eh? Tsukachi said. It doesn't. Because it has to do with me, Deku said. The two detectives felt their eyes widen. The Discord organization is a dangerous villain group. And this right here is their new boss work, he explained. I remember the report of this day. And when I saw the news, well, pulled on a second, the other detective interrupted. You knew this happened before the news reported it? Well, I remember seeing the news report 12 years ago. I also know the two victims' identities as the former crime boss, Mr. Livingston and the hero Bonsai, he said. Two names that the news hasn't released yet. All might turn to the older hero. W wait a minute. Deku nodded and gestured down the hall behind the two detectives. Let's go take a look then. I want you guys to see what I've been up against, he said. He walked past the two detectives and down the hall to the room. All Might turned to Snipe and shrugged before they all followed him. When they entered the room, two doctors were inside and talking as they cleaned up some tools. They entered with the two detectives behind them, and once the doors closed, the two doctors turned to them. Detectives and heroes, one of them wondered. All Might, what are you guys doing here? The other wondered. Tsukachi waved them off. We came to check on the bodies. I need to show them some things and explain what we're dealing with, he lied. The two doctors nodded. The two that just came in. They nodded. The doctors walked over to where the two were lying in wait. When they revealed the bodies, they all sighed as they saw Bonsai. We'll give you a few moments, one of the doctors said. They then left the room, leaving the heroes alone. Once they were alone, Deku approached Banzai. There is an unfortunate custom when it comes to the Discord organization. If someone wishes to usurp the boss, they would have to provide the challenge by bringing a hero. The hero must have been defeated in battle and unconscious upon delivery. The challenger and the boss then engage in a one-on-one -on -one battle with only one's fisticuffs, he explained. Principal Nezu raised a brow. A simple and barbaric custom, he noted. Oh, it was straight to the point, proving to the boss that the challenge was legitimate. If a regular grunt simply walked up to the boss and challenged him, the challenge would be viewed as a joke, Deku explained. The winner of this duel would become the new boss, and the life of the other would be in their hands. Snipe turned to him. Deku reached over with gloved hands and raised Bonsai's neck. See the markings. He was killed while still unconscious. Evidence of intense injuries throughout the body suggests Bonsai was seriously beaten before his death, he explained. Cause of death was asphyxiation followed by a broken neck. He also suffered a serious fracture in his lower back, paralyzing him as he died. You can see imprints of large fingers wrapped around his throat and his charts confirm the injuries. All Might leaned in, the same for Mr. Livingston, including evidence of serious beatings. However, there is something different between the two, he said. Check his chart. Principal Nezu checked Bonsai's chart. As Snipe checked Mr. Livingston's, All Might turned to his successor. Deku, what's going on here? He wondered. Deku sighed and walked over to a table. On it was a small plastic bag with a single pin inside. The villain that I'm after is the leader of the Discord organization. This pin is the mark of the boss of the gang, he said. The former symbol of peace looked at it. It was a chaos star with a broken crown on top of it. The boss obviously lost the fight. 
and as the rules dictate, the winner must break the crown of the former boss pin to symbolize a fall from grace. Mr. Livingston lost the match, and since his life then belonged to the new boss, he was immediately disposed of. Principal Nezu's eyes widened. Principal Nezu, did you find anything on Mr. Livingston? Deku wondered. The strange animal principal, Hiro nodded. Mr. Livingston registered as having a lion-type quirk about 45 years ago. He's been the leader of the Discord organization for probably half that time, but... Deku sighed as he removed his gloves. He's quirkless in death, he said. All might turn to the former boss. This is why I brought you guys in. This is the work of the Chaos King, the villain I've been chasing for a while now. He followed me through time, apparently, Deku said. The former symbol of peace felt his eyes widen in fear. I as he, he doesn't have all for one. The quirk died about ten years ago, my time, he said. However, technology can pick up what evolution and nature dropped. Stealing quirks has become a science that the Chaos King perfected in recent years. In fact, quirks have become one of his most successful ventures of illicit business, right there with Trigger and other quirk-boosting drugs. Principal Nezu nodded. I was asked some time ago what I feared the most in this world. The human drive to conquer nature is at the top, and if what you're saying is true, then the Chaos King made that a reality, he explained. Stealing and selling quirks. Damn, Snipe mumbled. All for one did that on a smaller scale back during the height of his power. Though he usually just granted powers to whoever he saw fit, willing or unwillingly, All Might said. Deku nodded. The quirk trade is all the rage back in my time. Millions of US dollars are made through quirks alone and span 10 countries. Some people buy several quirks and arm their own smaller gangs with the very best, he explained. Some create enforcers with multiple quirks to keep heroes at bay. All Might shook his head. What the hell happened in the future to make the Chaos King do this? Deku turned away from his master. Nothing good. The point between eras of power is great enough for dark forces to grow. The Chaos King sat by and watched the world changed and made his moves across the board, he said. He turned to the heroes with a fire in his eyes. But that's why I'll be the one to put him in his place. He has hurt and killed too many people. All might eye the two bodies in the room. It reminded me of all for one when I started. Tsukachi clenched his fists. What can we do? He wondered. Deku shrugged. In the next few years, the scales of balance will tip, allowing a window for the Chaos King to assume control. By now, he has a prototype of the technology capable of stealing quirks. However, his current location is unknown. He seemingly appeared out of nowhere one day. And we haven't found anything useful, he said. But, he won't be a serious problem for a while. Do you mean the future Chaos King or the present? The present. My Chaos King will try to expedite the organization's rise to power. Trust me, you don't want to deal with the Paranormal Liberation Front and the Discord organization. Their powers combined will destroy hero society and breed anarchy, Deku said. But I will focus on stopping the Chaos King before he messes with history. All Might and Principal Nezu exchanged looks as Deku approached the two bodies and bowed to each of them. The heroes beside him followed the show of respect as the symbol of peace replaced the sheet. The doctors came back in once they were done and bid their farewells. When they returned to the car, Snipe sighed and removed his gas mask. Midoriya, where is the bastard? Deku shrugged. Anywhere in the area. He knows of my powers and has taken the appropriate countermeasures against them. Right now, the Discord organization is just a small group of guns for hire for other villain groups. With the Chaos King in power, he'll focus on recruitment and striking against the general public. Heroes in the surrounding cities should be on alert, he said. Snipe nodded and took out his phone. I can imagine that Shigaraki hired them to try to steal our hard drive, he said. Deku nodded. It's likely. He backed out of the parking spot and drove them both back toward the school. When they returned and entered the main campus, the young Midoriya watched his older self get out of the car. He stood by along with Yuraraka, Yeyarazu, and Ida as they watched him. Wonder where they've been, Yuraraka mentioned. The note he left earlier didn't explain much if anything. Just that they had to check up on some things, Yeyarazu said. Of course, leaving with All Might and Principal Nezu must mean that it was imperative. It was probably something to do with Deku. I mean, he looks like he has his hands full here, Ida said. What kind of hero work would he need to do here? Midoriya shrugged. Interestingly, he's taking this kind of mindset, really, he muttered. Oh, the young inheritor nodded. He seems to be so focused on something. I wonder what. At that point, Mina Ashido walked by with two other girls from a different class. She stopped in front of the group and tapped them on the shoulders, telling them that she'd catch up to them in a moment. Maybe he can fix the fridge in the common space. There's a giant dent in the side of it, and he was the last one to leave yesterday, she said. Yeyarazu nodded. Interesting that he did that. Midoriya nodded. Come on Deku, let's go grab a bite already. I think the line is getting smaller. Yuraraka exclaimed. Mina smiled. It is, so hurry up and grab some food. She exclaimed as she ran off again. Ada smiled. She's right. Let's go eat, he said. 
Yeyorazu smiled and turned, only to meet a pair of older emerald eyes. Dideku. The others turned to her. The symbol of peace was standing right behind her with a slight smile on his face. Hey, you guys, what's up? Midoriya blinked at his older self. I won't get used to seeing an older me anytime soon, he thought to himself. Ida smiled. We were just going to get some lunch, he said. Would you like to join us? Deku smiled and shook his head. I kinda don't have an appetite right now. I think I'll eat later, though, he said. Is everything okay? Hiroraka wondered. Deku nodded. Just some hero work I had to do real quick, he said. He reached over and patted his younger self on the head. Go on and eat, guys. I'll see you all later. The group nodded almost in unison and said their goodbyes. Once they left for lunch Rush's cafeteria, the symbol of peace turned to look out the window. His smile was replaced with a deep frown as he reached into his pocket to pull out a pin. The pin was a chaos star with an intact crown on the top. As he stared at the pin, he remembered the day he took it from the crime boss. The battle they had on the tallest skyscraper in the middle of an island filled to the brim with villains. While he tore the jacket and took the pin, he almost lost his quirk in the process. Deku crushed the pin in his bare hands. He didn't feel the object's sharp point as he turned it into a bunch of little pieces. He sighed as he walked opposite in the opposite direction from his younger self. I need to find the Chaos King, but at this point, he must have gone underground to avoid my hearing. If he is recruiting, he'll have some of his goons topside looking into society's darkest corners. I should focus on finding them. Deku pocketed the crushed pin as he continued to walk. He activated his quirk and disappeared in the blink of an eye. Two days later, with the sun rising and coffee brewed, Deku smiled as he greeted the day. The previous days were slow for the symbol of peace as Class Tua completed their written exams in their respective subject. He supervised each day with Snipe's permission, giving the Western hero time to relax and prepare for what was coming next. Deku was quiet in his supervision as he used enhanced hearing to ensure the students weren't quietly whispering among each other. Instead of finding cheaters, Deku listened in on a few students as they mumbled to themselves as they tried to understand the exams. A few people he wasn't expecting to curse had done so, including Hagakir, threatening to shove a freshly sharpened pencil up the ass of whoever devised the Pythagorean theorem as well as other violent acts against whoever thought it was a good idea for heroes to understand. The symbol of peace kept his distance from her. When the second day ended, Deku marveled at how well everyone did at first glance. He saw more potential high grades than the previous year. Of course, Ida, Yeyorazu, Midoriya and Bekugo were at the top of the list. However, that day had passed, and now the day he had been waiting for had finally arrived. With his list for the final training exam in hand and his hero costume on, the symbol of peace instructed everyone to meet at ground beta fully dressed and ready for action. He didn't wait for them at the dorms, instead going on ahead to ensure everything was ready for them. When he arrived, Principal Nezu, Snipe, and Mr. Aizawa were waiting for him at the front gate. The cuddly principal waved at the symbol and leapt out of Aizawa's scarf. I can see you're excited for the day to begin Deku, he observed. Deku smiled and waved the list in front of him. Oh I definitely am. I'm having the class meet us here at 10.30 so we have some time. I also want them to be fed, showered and prepped before they tear their hair out, he said. Of course in a true situation, heroism doesn't follow a serious schedule, Mr. Aizawa said. While absolutely true, I'd rather they eat first. The last thing I need is everyone failing because their stomachs begin to mimic Chewbacca from those old world movies, Deku commented. A well-fed hero is a happy hero. Mr. Aizawa rolled his eyes. So, after initial grading, it looks like Class 2 had definitely improved from last year's exams, he said. I'm thankful for Snipe encouraging them. Also thankful that Yeyurazu and my younger self-organized study groups, Deku commented as pocketed the paper. There was a lot of goofing around but a lot actually happened. I bet, Principal Nezu, the young cannot stay young forever. They also can't be quiet most nights, Snipe commented. Seriously Aizawa, how did you do it? The erasure hero raised his hair up, exposing his ears, earplugs most of the time. Also having Ida and Yeyurazu handle the class helps tremendously. Snipe chuckled. Well Yeyurazu and Midoriya have done quite well for them academically. But I swear if I hear any more Mario music, I'm cutting off their internet privileges, he warned. Deku laughed. It could be worse though. Aizawa cracked a smile. It could. Principal Nezu smiled. So, everything inside is all set. Ms. Winters is also on site for emergency heals and keeping the drones in line, he said. To be quite honest, I cannot wait to see how everything will turn out. It's too bad you won't be participating this time around. Principal Nezu, Snipe said as much as I enjoyed it last year, I think it's for the best, he said. You had way too much fun, Deku remarked with a smirk. Principal Nezu smirked, maybe a little bit. Mr. Aizawa smiled and looked outward. He saw two approaching in their hero costumes and with brave faces on. Midoriya was leading the pack with Yeyurazu right behind him. The two were conversing among themselves while everyone else simply followed. 
except for Kaminari, who was showing Shinzo something funny on his phone. Right behind them was a familiar head of blonde hair. Mr. Aizawa groaned inward as All Might accompanied the class, talking to some of the kids as they walked. Deku smiled as he watched his former master walk towards him, but the smile faded the longer he stared at him. His face relaxed and his shoulders dropped as his eyes appeared to water. His sudden change was noticed by Principal Nezu as he looked up at him. Deku's expression quickly changed as the class finally arrived. Welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're all here. Well duh. This is for a grade. Back Hugo bellowed out from the back. A few chuckles rolled through the crowd. Deku smiled and rubbed the back of his head. Oh of course. Right. I forgot about that little tidbit. He confessed. Mina was basically jumping in place. Suo. What's the big secret? Will we get to see you in action? Maybe have us fight each other in a mock battle? Shoji wondered. Perhaps you want to see how we've improved with our quirks, Takoyami said. Deku shook his head while wearing a smile on his face. I'll get to it in a second. Remember when I said it was going to be somewhat similar to your mock battle when you guys first arrived? I'm keeping that promise, but with an extra twist. He declared. The symbol of peace pulled out his phone and tapped on it a few times. He held his phone in the air soon afterward and pressed one final button. At that moment, 20 phones buzzed or played a tune in front of him. All of class 2 a checked their phones to see a single message. Don't reveal your affiliation, okay. Keep it to yourself at all costs, Deku commanded. Now, it's about time you learn something new about being a hero. Expect the unexpected. Back Hugo rolled his eyes. We've done this already, perhaps, but this will be different. Now, everyone in the class has been given an affiliation. Heroes or villains. Heroes will have a specific set of tasks to complete as well as villains. Sounds of confused students rolled through the crowd. Here is the general scenario. A group of villains have kidnapped several high-ranking members of government and are holding them hostage in the city. Police are hard at work at determining their location, however, there are complications. 1. The heroes have no idea where the villains are hiding. 2. The heroes don't know exactly how many hostages there are. And 3. The heroes have 15 minutes to find the villains before they escape. Oh damn. Sounds like the heroes are at a disadvantage. Hagakure said. Deku nodded. The villains are at an advantage by simply being in the situation. They have control of the hostages, they have time to kill, and they have the element of surprise on their side. In real life, it is very much possible that villains will have the upper hand on you all. You cannot expect to win every battle and beat every villain. Some of the young heroes murmured in agreement. Now, here is what the heroes can do. They can either actively search for the villain base, or be attempt to take command of cell towers located on the rooftops of some of these buildings. These devices can be used to triangulate the calls that villains are making to negotiate the surrender of their hostages. Secure three towers and the heroes will move in to secure the hostages. Deku explained. Of course, if you go for the cell towers, the villains will know what you are attempting and can either intercept you or let you come to them. You can also attempt to find the villain's hideout without the towers, however, it will be difficult. All the buildings are the same and there will be no distinct markings or clues that will lead you to them. This may be time-consuming but it's also doable. Sue raised her hand. I have a question. Deku smiled. Yes Tsu. What about the hostages? What do we do if we find them? Hero. Well, if you do find the base, and you manage to reach the hostages, there is an escape gate you can use. You can do that or escort them to a safe shelter, such as police stations or a hero agency or maybe even a hospital, Deku explained. The only way heroes can win is if the hostages are safely escorted to either the gate or the shelter. The class nodded. Some of you may want to subdue your villains, however, you will not be able to determine the location of the hostages if you do. The objective is to secure the hostages, not win a fight, Deku said. Now, for the villains, time is on your side. The heroes have no idea where you are or how many hostages you have exactly. Fifteen minutes is how long you have until you escape with your hostages. You can sit and wait out the clock, however, there is a challenge. The cell towers will reveal your location if they are captured by the heroes so it's advisable to not take a nap or do something else that may distract you. The heroes can, if they have the right quirks, locate you even without it, he said. So, here are your objectives. You can stop the heroes from accessing all of the cell towers. You can recapture the hostages if the heroes grab them, Deku explained. Unlike the heroes, the villains have multiple ways to win here. Subdue the heroes, prolong the fight until the timer runs out, or recapture the hostages if they're taken. Yeyarazu pondered their test. So this is as accurate as possible? Deku nodded. These situations can happen. They're delicate operations so you do need to be careful so the hostages aren't harmed, he explained. In fact, this is the scenario that I have experienced a few years ago with members of the American delegation and the Prime Minister were held hostage by a villain group. The class all started asking questions about the incident, however, Deku waved them off. Regardless, this is your test. Hero team and villain teams will be comprised randomly for authenticity. 
when in the field and multiple heroes are needed. You don't get to choose who charges in with you to battle, he said. Both teams will be given mobility equipment so the fight can be a little more easier. The class settled finally. Now, once the doors open, you'll find two makeshift hallways, one marked heroes and one marked villains. You will proceed into your assigned hallway and wait in the common space until you and your teammate are called into action. You will not know who will be in your team and you won't be able to view other teams before you. Wait, you mean, Uraraka asked. That's right. You won't be learning from your teammates. They won't be able to share any intel with you. You will only hear me declare a winning team or if a special circumstance has occurred. Now, once you're finished with your test, pass or fail, you will enter a new common space where you will monitor the next group. You will also be briefed on how well you did and where you need to improve, Deku explained. Any questions? Silence. Deku smiled as Mr. Aizawa pressed a button on his belt. The large doors that lead to the training grounds opened. And sure enough, two handmade hallways were there and led to two opposing buildings. Mr. Aizawa will be taking care of the villains group and I'll be overseeing the heroes. Best of luck to all of you and I hope you all enjoy this test. Deku exclaimed. The class entered the facility with some unexpected faces moving toward the villain building. Yeyarazu stood by and watched the class become divided, even seeing Yuraraka follow Mina Ashido and Kaminari into the villain's building while Midoriya caught up with the class rep. Yuraraka waved at the duo before disappearing into the hallway. After a few moments, the duo arrived in a large and mostly empty space. The room was red with gold trimmings, truly something that shouldn't exist in a training center. There were cushions laid out everywhere to sit on, a stack of magazines on a few of the many scattered desks, and a few speakers playing lo-fi music in the background. Some of their classmates were already lounging on the chairs while a few others were shadow boxing while using their quirks. Huh, I didn't know we had rooms like this down here, Yeyarazu commented. Talk about a world outside of our own. You said it. Midori amused. Kinda want those cushions for the common space back in the dorms though. A hand rested on each other's shoulders and lightly squeezed. Deku politely pushed past the duo and approached the middle of the room. He clapped twice, earning everyone's attention. Everyone listen up. Everyone turned to him with undivided attention. We'll be starting the first round soon. I hope you're all ready to wrap up this term with heads held high. Everyone nodded. Deku reached into his pocket and pulled out a red flash drive. When your team is assembled, you'll be given these flash drives. They'll capture the cell towers you need to locate the villain base. You'll also receive the hover souls that Hatsum invented as well as her wire arrows. Don't lose your drives, otherwise your job will get a lot more difficult. Keep your heads on straight. Trust each other, work on your strengths and weaknesses, and you'll overcome the enemy, understand? Yes sir, everyone exclaimed. The symbol of peace smiled. Excellent. Now then, the final exam will begin in a moment. Remember, you'll have no idea what the team before you is doing. The whole purpose of this test is to make do with what you have in that moment. Understand? Heads nodded. Now, I gotta debrief the villain group. Relax for a little bit and I'll call out the first group soon. The announcement will only be broadcasted here so you won't get to know your opponents. Best of luck heroes. Thank you sir. Everyone called out. Deku nodded and turned away from them and left the room for everyone else to start making plans. He pocketed the flash drive and took out a piece of paper with two names on it and the number 5 written next to them. It read, Izuku Midoriya and Momo Yeirazu when Deku called out the first team, Sugarman and Invisible Girl were first called onto the scene. They exited the building where the hero lobby was situated and escorted to a random area on the grounds. Once situated, they were both given an earpiece communicator and a box with equipment. There were two pairs of boots and two wire arrow packs created by Mei Hatsum. With the boots on and their wire arrows situated, the simulation began. Listen up, heroes. We got an emergency. A voice said on the device. Hagakir turned to Sato. Is that Deku? She wondered. Sato shrugged. Makes sense, really, he said. The American president and her security detail, along with the prime minister, have all been taken by a criminal group stationed in the area. The city is quarantined. However, we have reason to believe that they have a way to escape. We need you two to find the subjects and get them back safely. Hagakir nodded. Got it. Copy that. Sato exclaimed, earning a giggle from Hagakir. You have been given special mobility equipment to get you through the city faster. Find them soon. Use the cell towers if you wish, Deku said, over and out. Once the line went dead, the two heroes nodded and ran off into the mock city. As they progressed through the city, Sato immediately noticed the carnage that was around them. Multiple mock cars were destroyed in various ways, including crushed and blackened from a fire. The pungent smell of smoke from a gasoline fire was strong to the baking hero. Police and fire department cutouts and a few vehicles were in the area, making it appear as though they were handling the situation. Sato volunteered to speak to one of the cutouts while his partner surveyed the scene. Hagakir approached one of the crushed vehicles and noticed it was a black sedan with a pair of flags in the front. 
She checked inside and noted that there was nothing inside. The president's car. Makes sense. The flags give it away, she thought to herself. She continued to look around, checking the scene. Besides the broken cars, there appeared to be damage to the buildings as well. Did All Might come through here or something? Hagakir wondered. Her hands braced on her hips as she entertained her thoughts. Or Deku. He must have caused that damage to make it seem like a strong villain blew through here. Something big must have been following them. She commented as she brushed her gloved hand against the crushed car. Sato nodded. We should report in, he said, cracking a smile at the protocol they had to learn before they started. He pressed his hand on the communicator and spoke. Come in, Tokyo PD. Are you there? Sugarman, this is Tokyo PD. What's your status? Deku said on the other end. Sato cracked a grin as he pressed on his ear. We're on the scene of the abduction. What do we know about the villains? So far, very little. We have a few of them in custody. However, we have reports that two individuals were seen leading the hostages away from the scene. The ones here are refusing to cooperate. He reported, local heroes did what they could but couldn't rescue the prime minister and the president. Copy that, Sato said. Sir, it looks like something big came through here. Any heavy hitters in custody? Hagakir wondered. Just one. He has a mild gigantification quirk and was apprehended pretty quickly, Deku reported. Right. Thank you. The line went dead soon afterward. Sato turned to his invisible partner. You thinking about something? Yep. If those villains were leading the two away, they must have had to duck away or else someone would have recognized them. I don't think they went very far from the crime scene, she said. Sato looked around. Oh hey, you're right. So, Hagakir slipped her gloves and boots off before speaking in a hushed tone. They could be around here somewhere, just waiting for everything to cool down so they can escape. I can look for them while you stay here and make it look like this is your concern. Oh, that's a great idea. But wait, what if you find them? Hagakir's thought stopped. Oh, oh damn. She pondered this for a moment as she shifted her stance to think. Sato could only guess this from the wire arrow pack moving to the side. We can communicate through here. But I hope we aren't against anyone with great hearing, she mused. Sato nodded. Just be careful. All right. Got it. Hagakir slipped off her wire arrow and ran off to find the villains. As Sato turned to focus on the scene in front of him, a single thought suddenly invaded his mind. His face burned bright red as he face palmed. I just saw her get undressed, didn't I? He said to himself. He shook his head. It's a good thing she's always invisible. A few minutes passed, and Hagakir was getting nowhere. True to Deku's word, there was no indication that the villain hideout was around. Many buildings looked structurally sound, and no police presence was detected in these areas. Cutouts of wealthy civilians and default heroes littered the streets, with many giving terrifying smiles. She dashed through many of them, slipping by without knocking them over as she went. She soon found herself arriving at a town square. The lot had a large fountain with cutouts of young people, college age perhaps, sitting around and arranged to look like they were having conversation. A few cutout police officers were situated around the area, and some men and women in suits and rifles in hand. Secret service, maybe. Hagakir wondered. Numerous buildings surrounded the square. Many had corporate logos and a large number of well-dressed cutouts. Some were law firms, some looked like banks, and one. One had some movement inside, noticing the shifting shadows inside one of the buildings. The invisible hero started to search for higher ground. While the fountain was a good idea, the water appeared to be cold. Some construction equipment opposite of the building, however, seemed to be perfect. The scaffolding and ladders left behind by faux construction workers provided just enough for her to get a decent look in. Once she was at the right spot, she saw her villains. The unmistakable eye of one Mizo Shoji peeked out of the window and looked around, thankful for her invisibility. Hagakir watched as the eye looked around some more before retreating into the building. With the information she needed, she raised her invisible hand to the comm unit in her ear, but she stopped. Choji is there. He could have an ear out, too, waiting for a sound. I need to find Sato and tell him, she thought to herself. She lowered her hand and leaped off of her perch. With feet on the ground, she dashed off back toward where she came from. She slipped by the cutouts without missing a beat, careful not to knock one over and give away the element of surprise. Once she was far enough away from the square, she ran into Sato. Literally. The sweet's hero grunted as an invisible mass crashed into his chest. He staggered back and heard an oh-oh come from in front of him. H. Hagakur, is that you? The stealth hero nodded. Yeah, damn, I barely moved you, didn't I? Sato chuckled and rubbed the back of his head. Yeah, my bad. I wasn't expecting you, he said. Hagakur giggled. So I have been getting better. Nice. Uh, anyway, what's going on? Did you find the villain lair? Yep, and you're not going to believe it. It's Shoji. Sato froze. As Shoji, you saw him. Well, more like his eye, but it was definitely him. He was looking around in this plaza just a little ways back there, she said. Ooh, Sato raised a finger. Hum, what's wrong? Why you know I can't see where you're pointing to, right? 
The stealth hero was quiet for a moment before Sato heard a slap. Reiite, I forgot that I'm not in uniform. Sato cracked a smile. It's okay. You want to laugh, don't you? She asked him. Oh yeah, he admitted. Hagakure sighed. Later, okay. Anyway, I saw them not too far from here. I can lead you there. But you'll need to stay hidden when we get close. Wouldn't want Shoji to see you, she warned. Sato nodded and handed Hagakure one of her gloves. Lead the way. With her glove back on, Hagakure led him back where she came from. When they arrived, Sato had to duck out of the way, and Hagakure hid her gloved hand. Shoji's eye had returned and scanned the square once more. Thankfully, Hagakure's invisibility remained consistent as she watched the eye return to the building. Breathing a sigh of relief, Hagakure pushed Sato further back and removed her glove. All right, here's the plan. I'll go in and grab the hostages. I'll distract them so you can fly in there with these. Arrow things. We'll take them from two directions and win the day. She silently cheered. Sato gave her a thumbs up. Great plan. They won't suspect a thing. Hagakure was silent for a moment. Um, Hagakure. Sato, be careful with that thumb of yours. Hum, what's wrong? You almost thumbed my breast, she said. That would have hurt. Sato's face burned bright red as he lowered his thumb. I am sorry. As long as it wasn't intentional. And you didn't hit it, so you're safe, she said. Sato smiled. Safe? Hagakure sighed. Here I do then. Wait for the alarms they possibly have. If they don't, I'll make some noise anyway, she said. Good luck. You too. The patter of bare feet running away was all he heard before that sound disappeared. He sighed and peeked out from behind the corner. It'd be really bad if Gyro is up there too. Meanwhile, inside the villain's lair, Mizo Shoji and Kayoka Gyro were both sitting at different parts of the room. The room was decorated with a large monitoring station, with several monitors, a keyboard about as long as the punk rock girl herself, and many other exciting gadgets. The walls were decorated with posters and other villain gear, including a poster of Chisaki pointing outward with the caption I want you to stay away from me. The room also had a cabinet with several spears and bats as weapons. Shoji's and Gyro's wire arrows were discarded and left on a table situated near the doorway leading further into the building. Shoji retracted his eye from the window. Still quiet out there. I would have thought someone would have attacked the towers by now, he admitted. He turned to his partner behind him. Anything? Gyro retracted her earphone jacks from the floor. Nothing. I doubt the other team knows we're here, she said. It's too quiet to assume they don't, Shoji said. They may know where we are now. If they do, we can take them. They won't get the drop on us, Gyro commented. Shoji nodded and peered outside once more. I don't get it, though. Deku gave us the whole game. And we're worried about the heroes knocking on our door, he said. Gyro shrugged. This is supposed to be close to real, right? I mean, it's not like real villains will play by the rules just like we will, right? Well yeah, but still, Shoji said as he leaned back. He's also interesting. Oh, future symbol of peace isn't interesting by title. Well, there's that, but there's something. Different. He feels different. Gyro nodded. True. He does seem to have his head in the clouds most days. And I heard he nearly crushed All Might in a hug when he arrived. It's almost like he hasn't seen him in so long. True. And the way he fought that villain the other day. One punch, and that was it. Even getting the hostages out without the guy realizing it, she continued. To think that Midoriya grows up to become him, symbol of peace and bona fide badass. One of Shoji's mouths smirked. Badass, eh? Gyro shrugged. Who knows what he's done between now for us and now for him, she said. I suppose. Shoji peered out the window once more. I bet Bakugo is pissed. Midoriya becoming the number one hero must have left a bad taste in his mouth. He commented as he scanned the public square. Mina was talking about it the other day. Bakugo flipped later that first night, she said. I mean, I'd understand it because we're all trying to be top heroes. And here comes Midoriya destined to take the spot from Endeavor. Talk about fate dropping a hint. Shoji laughed. That was surprising, wasn't it? Seeing him move like that right after those internships. Going up against All Might in the finals. Chasing down those villains at the camp too. I mean, I thought he was insane going after Bakugo with his two broken arms. Did he ever say what happened there? Just that he fought a villain. Honestly, he was quiet on the details, Shoji said. Gyro shrugged. Anyway, he grew up. Fool gauntlets too. Shoji chuckled. Yeah, before he could say anything. The alarms inside the base began to blare. Red sirens filled the room with light, causing the two faux villains to leap out of their skin. Warning, warning, prisoner containment cells opened. Gyro and Shoji locked gazes. Oh hell no. The hearing hero bellowed out. They got past us. B but that's not right. I saw nothing out here. Unless, Gyro beat him to it. Hagakure, Sue is on our side. And she can turn invisible, leaving only her. The hearing hero leaped off of the ground and ran out of the room. Earphone Jack, wait. She may not be the only one here. Gyro stopped upon hearing her hero name and turned. You still have the key Deku gave you? He asked her. She nodded. 
Before she could say anything, she heard two thuds coming from outside. Shoji turned to peer out when he saw Sato closing and using the wire arrows. His eyes were wide, and a wide smile was on his face as he flew into the building. The sweet's hero burst through the window with two packs of sugar crushed in his hands. Shoji's eyes widened upon seeing the packs. The force of his entrance knocked back Shoji as Jiro reached over and smashed the cabinet containing the weapons. She grabbed the bat and raised it in a defensive stance. While she kept her gaze on the intruder, she continued to flinch toward the door, fighting the urge to leave her partner to stop Hagakure. Sato eyed Shoji and smiled. Let's go. He lunged forward and threw his first punch into Shoji's raised guard. With his multiple arms all turning into fists, Shoji rushed into the fight. His fists flew through the air, meeting the raised guard of the sweet's hero. Sato braced himself by shifting his stance, becoming a wall standing proud against the onslaught. Once he found an opening, Shoji fired three fists into Sato's side, forcing him to break his guard. The second his guard dropped, the multi-armed foe villain fired a series of jabs and angled uppercuts to subdue the baker. Thankfully with some training with Midoriya, he managed to start dodging his attacks by shifting his upper body. He continued to step backward until his heel knocked against a piece of debris from his entrance. When Shoji fired an uppercut, Sato acted quickly. He lunged forward into Shoji's exposed core and launched a jab at his stomach. The impact momentarily stunned the multi-armed man just long enough to execute a follow-up and start to gain ground against his foe. A few punches in, and Shoji recovered enough to swing at the hero. Sato took the hits like a champ, only staggering lightly. The two combatants seemed to be locked in combat while Gyro inched toward them with her jacks twitching. She needed to get close enough so Sato wouldn't react to her impending stun attack. With her weapon raised against Sato, she made significant progress. Shoji noticed his partner's advancement and pulled back one of his arms to raise a hand against her. The hand morphed into a mouth right afterward. No, Gyro, go stop Hagakure from winning, he said as he blocked one of Sato's strikes. She nodded and bolted from the room. When Hagakure entered the cell block, she wasn't expecting the QICD robots from earlier that year. The quirk identification and combat drones were once a significant threat against the class. Programmed to scan quirks and determine the best course of defeating them, the mechs quickly turned from a training dummy to a menace that almost killed a few of their classmates. Thankfully, they were defeated, and their creator became a true student of the school. The mechs were scrapped, she thought, so why were they here? Her questions were answered when one of the mechs grasped the bars of its cell. Help us, those villains have captured us, it said in a female voice. The invisible girl froze. W wait, can you? The memory came back to her. The match had heat sensors built in to combat her quirk. We can see you, Hero. Please, help us. She sighed heavily. Just my luck, too. She muttered before she turned to the computer sitting on the wall. Pressing a few buttons, she opened the cell doors and set off the alarm. Flashing red lights blinded her, and the siren was almost deafening. The match that was calling for help had an American flag holographic pin on its chest. Other doors opened, and more of the mechs emerged. Many were in a group. One of the other mechs had a holographic Japanese flag pin on its chest. With the hostages confirmed, she ran past them. Follow me, we gotta get out of here. She called out. One of the groups all turned to each other before the president mech, and the prime minister mech brushed past them and followed the hero. She burst through the same door that she came in from when she felt and heard a loud crash from a few levels above her. Let's go, Sato screamed over the radio. Though invisible, Hagakure couldn't help but smile. One of the mechs spoke up. W what was that? It asked. Another hero is covering for us. The villains won't be able to chase us, so we can escape without worrying about them. Hagakure cheered as she rounded a corner and burst through a stairwell door. She held the door as the mech followed her and descended. Go all the way down to the floor level. The door leads to the back alley. She called out. Thank you, hero. You saved us. Put some clothes on. Hagakure sighed. She needed a better hero costume soon. Once the last mech passed through the door, the stealth hero ran after them. Back in the detention room, Gyro ran in and saw the cell doors open. Her eyes widened as she felt the hairs on her head stood straight up. Oh shit, shit to chit chit She ran to the computer. The doors were opened by Hagakir. All right, since she saw she left her name behind as Invisible Girl was here. She sighed as she brought up the camera feed, as she had thought. Not one bit of Hagakir was visible as she saw one of the mechs suddenly grasp the bars. The computer lit up green, and the doors opened, releasing the hostages. When they all ran out of the detention area, she cursed again and reached into her pocket to pull out the key Shoji reference. The key wasn't impressive to look at, a standard house key with a black and red rubber hold placed on it. The key hung off of a keychain in the shape of a purple Vichy side and looked at the computer. Sure enough, there was a slot for this underneath a big red button inside a glass cover. This key must only be used if you have no other choice. Don't lose this too, okay. Once you use it, leave it in the slot. And I'll grab it when the test is done, Deku had told them. 
Gyro gulped and pressed her hand on the comm in her ear. I'm using the key, she said. The sound of grunting and punches landing was all she heard. She heard Shoji speak after hearing a quiet thud as if something landed far from the faux villain. Do it, earphone jack. He called out. With the all clear, she inserted the key, turned it clockwise, and pressed the button as it was made available. A loud horn sound erupted across the battlefield, echoing into the two waiting chambers. The villain team has called in their enforcer. The students in the hero room all jumped and looked at the intercom. Their eyes were all wide open as they processed the message. D did, Anjiro stammered. I I think Takoyami thought. Deku's voice came on the intercom. Did I forget to mention that the villain team still has reinforcements in the area? No, oops, he said. Kirishima stood straight up. Why do I mean oops? Heroes, a bit of advice. You need to expect the unexpected in these situations. A thousand things can go wrong even if you are fully prepared. You can plan everything down to how the wind speed will be during the fight. But the human error cannot be truly anticipated, Deku explained. All of the villain groups you'll face today will have a way to call in reinforcements. However, even they won't know who it is until he or she appears. The intercom shut off as Yeyarazu turned to Midori. He's going for as realistic as possible. Ha! Huh. Midoriya nodded. No idea about who our opponents are. No idea who our teammates are against. And no idea who the enforcer is. The villains truly have the advantage here. Yeyarazu nodded. She gulped nervously as her hands started to fidget. Regardless of whoever my teammate is, we have to win. Back on the battlefield, Sato and Shoji were still locked in a standoff of epic proportions, raising blocks and firing off jabs and, in Sato's case, kicks were all they were doing. Both of their defenses were strong against their respected offensive skills. Sato launched an uppercut while Shoji went in for a jab, with both of them hitting their marks with enough force to send themselves back. With a bit of room to breathe, Sato looked up to his opponent and smiled. He wiped the blood from his mouth and regained his fighting stance. Why you got stronger? He remarked. Shoji created a mouth on one of his arms and smirked. You too. Damn, your guard is strong. Yours too. With the multiple arms, it's almost impossible to break through it. Sato complimented. Shoji nodded and recreated a fist. Your teammate released our hostages. And now we're going to have to get them back. Not going to happen. Invisible girl is probably already near the gate and is just about to cross it, he said. With our enforcer activated, I'm sure she'll be captured too. It's only a matter of time, Shoji said. Maybe we'll have you join them and raise the price for their return. Sato smiled. We'll see. And then he rushed in with his fist raised. Shoji responded in kind, raising his defenses and absorbing the attack. The room rumbled as the sweet's hero retracted his attack and moved to find a weak point in the faux villain's defenses. Thinking that he had the right time to make a move, Shoji moved to attack only to open himself up to a straight shot from Sato. The punch landed on his cheek and sent him staggering back. Sato continued to deliver consecutive shots to his opponent's core while his defenses were opened up. The faux villain grunted before grabbing Sato and throwing him away so he may recover for a moment. On the other side of the room, Sato chuckled and reached for his calm. Invisible girl, what's your status? Well, I heard they have an enforcer, so, you know, that's fun to hear. We're outside and are heading to the escape gate. She reported. He nodded. Good. Keep an eye out for Shoji interrupted with a surprise punch to the face. He followed up with a rising uppercut to the stomach and a downward strike that knocked the hero to the floor. Shoji panted heavily as he turned away from the hero and removed his mask. Sato looked up and wanted to launch a counterattack, but his partner's voice on the other end stopped him. I see the enforcer. It's Cementos. Sato's eyes widened. He saw Shoji was still turned away, giving him an opening. Even if he worked on his quirk, I need to be fast and knock him out. I need to help Hagakure. As fast as he could, Sato pushed himself up and charged at the faux villain. Shoji turned with his fists, ready for another rising strike. However, Sato swept to the side and into his opponent's personal space. With his fist clenched, he fired a single strike into his stomach, knocking the air from his lungs. Shoji fell to the ground, dazed and spent from their fight. Sato, standing tall and victorious against his enemy, panted heavily. Why you're a tough one, Shoji. He smiled. I'd hate to be a true villain going against you. He fastened the wire arrow on his back and approached the window. Hagakure needs my help. And I won't have us lose because of Cementos. We'll win. You can count on that. Sato leaped backward out the window and fired the wire arrow up to the rooftop. The arrows hit their marks and pulled the hero up the building with incredible speed. He never lost the smile on his face as he shot up and landed on the roof with a somersault before he started running. He cleared the building, leaped into the air and fired the arrow at the other building. I'm coming, Hagakure. 